Dear professors, dear colleagues, dear friends, it's a great honor for us to start the webinar and you will meet really legendary speakers today, Professor Siegfried Kasper from Vienna, Austria, and Professor Sir Robin Murray from United Kingdom. This is the webinar titled Meet the Expert Number One. And this is really a unique event which is organized by uh, the science program on Master of Sciences and Clinical Mental Health by the Aristotle University of Saloniki, also Taiwan University and co-organized by Samara State Medical University. And now Professor Huang will introduce Professor Siegfried Kasper, who will yes. lead the first lecture on depression. Yes. Um, dear, dear, uh, dear distinguished scholars and everyone who join us in the webinar, uh, first of all, great, greetings from Taiwan. Um, the backdrop um, indicates the 101 Tower, which is the famous building in Taiwan. And I am Min Shi Huang from Taiwan, and I am the staff psychiatrist of Taipei City Psychiatric Center and I'm also the Associate Professor of Taipei Medical University. I'm really honored to co-chair with uh, Professor uh, Daria Smirnova from Russia for this big academic event, Meet the Expert. Um, the webinar will be, have, will be having two big shots in the globe. Professor Siegfried Kasper from Austria and Professor Robin Murray from UK. And it is my great pleasure to introduce the introduce the first speaker, Professor Siegfried Kasper. Actually, I might need two hours to introduce um, this legendary uh, figure. Um, but since we have to save time for Kasper's, uh, Professor Kasper's um, lecture, so I will um, put it in short and I can only pick up some points that catch my eyes. Uh, Dr. Kasper is the professor of psychiatry and, um, and uh, a chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Psychotherapy in the Medical School of Vienna, Austria. Uh, he got his PhD degree at the medical schools of University of Innsbruck, Austria, and the Universities of Fairburg and um, Hedberg, Germany. I hope my pronunciation is correct. Um, Dr. Kasper published nearly 650 papers and more than 250 books and book chapters in various areas of psychiatry. He concentrates on the biological basis and the mental disorders and their possible treatment approaches. And he also shows the very superb leadership in many international societies. For example, um, Dr. Cosper served on the executive, co executive committees of the advisory boards of several international societies, such as ECMP, EPA, and he was the president of WFSBP uh, from 2005 to 2009, and he was also the president of CIMP from 2020, um, 2018 to 2021. And, um, and he um, also got a great deal of awards and prizes in, um, many from many scientific um, societies. So as you can tell, he has been considered as the most influential um, person in the field of psychiatry in the world. Although, although uh, Professor Cosper has retired last year, but seems to be more active now in academic activities. For example, he held the CIMP 2021 virtual conference, which just uh, ended successfully last month. I was um, actually, I, the first time I met Professor Cosper was in 2018 in Vienna. I was so impressed by his cheerful personality and he's very knowledgeable and easy to talk to in many aspects of life. Um, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the big shot in the world, Professor Cosper. <laughs> 
Dear Ming-Chi, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much, Ming-Chi, for this very nice introduction. It's always a great pleasure to hear the voice from Taiwan. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't come in person this year, but we will come next year with the conference. Hopefully, we will have the pandemic then solved already. I'm not going to talk about pandemic today. I'm talking about depression. And I would like to share my screen in this uh, case. And uh, you'll see here the bird's eye view from Vienna. And you see here on the topic depression and brain health. I think it's quite important that we tie depression to diseases and also to health state, because depression is a word which is used all over the world. It's used from financial sources, that money depression, and so on and so forth. But when we talk about diseases, then of course, we have to think also about the brain. And what you see here, you see a bird's eye view of the Medical University of Vienna. And you see here, that's the part of the psychiatric department here that uh, is adjacent to the main building. We have like 154 beds and here are over 2000 beds. So you can imagine here are the cases of depression, which we studied so uh, extensively over the years. But over here, like in internal medicine, gynecology and so on and so forth, there are even more cases when you think about depression and internal diseases. I don't want to give you a lecture about history, but I would like to point out to you that here is the old psychiatric hospital built in 1786. That's about the time when Mozart was alive in Vienna. And our emperor in these days, you know, Austria in these days was a large country. Our emperor Joseph II was a very wise man because he said, well, psychiatry is part of medicine. And that was the old hospital. So he built the hospital in these days already next to the hospital because he said psychiatric patients are medical ill patients. <coughs> I'm mentioning this because sometimes it's forgotten and depression is thought, well, it's part of societal problems and it's uh, closer to philosophy or psychesthetics or whatever. And this means that we do not get a good understanding of our psychiatric patients, which are of great need for us. Since we have now the pandemic all over the world, we can see this right now also, that everybody is very much concerned about the COVID crisis. Of course, we are also very much concerned about the COVID crisis. And we should be aware, for instance, that our psychiatric patients, like depressed patients, have the 10 time fold likelihood to get the COVID infection. Bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, eight to nine times more likely. This has been recently published in the World Psychiatry Journal from our colleagues in United States who studied over 370,000 patients. So we should be aware that this COVID crisis affects also our psychiatric patients to a large extent because they might not take care of them that carefully. On the other hand, their brain probably doesn't work so properly. And we know that this COVID comes also through the nasal part into the central nervous system. And we need to take care of this. When I continue with the COVID crisis, I think it's quite important that we should be aware that when the pandemic is solved, when everybody is vaccinated, and we have a herd immunity, and we start working to a large extent, then our psychiatric patient, depressed patients will have a lot of problems, will be a rebound problem. Right now, the problem is that they get more COVID disease, but they do not get more depression at these days right now. But when there is this rebound later, we should be prepared that this is a very troublesome time for our patients. We know this, for instance, 
when uh, social systems break apart, like when the Soviet Union break apart, broke apart, the suicide rates were increasing like tenfold and so on and so forth. So please be aware when the COVID crisis is over, this will be a big problem for our psychiatric patients, specifically those with depression and more specifically for men, because men usually have higher suicide rates, at least double as high suicide rates when they do not have a job, when they do not have money, then they think, well, probably this is the best solution for them to solve this. That was my introduction, very actual to the COVID crisis. So also the COVID crisis will affect the brain, like we know from the Spanish flu, which was after the First World War, when there were a number of psychiatric diseases coming thereafter, which we nearly forgot again. And I'm quite sure that with the brain and the social system, we will have more of these diseases. Let's start then with my potential conflict of interest. I work with a number of companies together, advise them. And um, I think it's quite important that we keep this association because these companies, for instance, with the COVID crisis, they produce the vaccines, they produce the medication. And so we need to have a partnership collaboration, of course, in a very orderly manner. Let's start with the um, uh, worldwide uh, disease spectrum and the World Bank uh, uh, quite a time ago calculated the so-called disability adjusted life years, the so-called DALIs. And when you see here are the different diseases, you see the neuropsychiatric disorders is the largest part of this disability adjusted life years, which means how much of your life productivity you lose according to the disease. So like if you're ill for one year, one month, another month, then it adds up to one year. And if you die earlier, for instance, then of course this comes into also this disability adjusted life years. So neuropsychiatric disorders have the largest part followed by cardiovascular diseases, followed by cancer, and when you look then what is about the, I'm sorry, about the different diseases, you see unipolar affective disorder is the largest part of this disability adjusted life years. So if a system takes care of depression, this is very well invested because this affects not only the burden of the individual, but also the society where they live, because basically then they have to pay for this situation. Right now, I think we have the problem that we spend a lot of money, which is of course necessary for all the vaccines, but I, I think there might not be enough money left for also our psychiatric patients. So we need to be advise, uh, aware of this and advise also our politicians to be prepared for this. Let me talk about the treatment of uh, depression with antidepressants on the one hand side and on the other hand side with medication. Then you see when you make a public survey, which was done like for instance, a while ago in Germany, I have to say it didn't change that much. So usually the population thinks, well, antidepressants, they make addictive. 80% of them answered, yes, they make addictive. Does the antidepressant change your personality? Yes, they say it changes their personality. Well, we have to advise our patients, well, the antidepressants don't make you addictive. There are medication which make you addictive, but antidepressants are not part of this. And when they say, well, does it change the personality? We have to say, well, depression changes your personality. And there are some papers like in the American Journal of Psychiatry published from our French colleague, Professor Gorwood, indicating that depression itself is toxic. So why is it toxic? Because it has these high cortisol levels, 
And the brain doesn't like high cortisol levels. It always suggests there's some danger around and therefore it changes the neurogenesis to this extent that we do not have enough connections in our brain again for all the difficult tasks which we have to do. In the same line is that does a person remain her own if she takes antidepressants? Well, half of them say, well, it doesn't be the same. And do the antidepressants have a negative effect? Yes, they have a negative effect, 71% answer. I think these are the most important question which I'm always addressed when I talk to patients and we have to address these questions also when we talk to them, because when they go to, for instance, to their friends, their family, they will be all uh, confronted with this question. No, you shouldn't take so much. You shouldn't take this type, type of medication. You have a good relationship. You have a nice house. And so why do you take this? So we have to tell them it's a disease like other diseases and therefore needs to be properly treated. So the patient's expectation on psychiatric treatments also for depression, since the medication makes you addictive and medication change your personality, it refers also to the doctors. So they say, well, doctors who prescribe medication are not very empathetic, all over not good. On the other hand, doctors who only provide talking cure talking therapy are considered as empathetic and overall good. I think this is a very important point because it's the danger that depression gets more chronic, if not very well treated at the beginning. Let me give you uh, once more a uh, focus on the uh, psychiatric diseases, which I would like to call brain health. I think it's quite important to view that mental disorders are brain disorders of course, they are not disorders of lesions like stroke or like uh, multiple sclerosis. They are disorders of circuits, and I'll show you some of these circuits later. I think psychiatrists are very much inclined to always talk about the nurture, which has been development in the environment, and not talk too much about the nature of the disease. Uh, when patients come to see me, I always tell them, well, you see my bald hair right here, and usually patients say, oh, doctor, it looks very good on you, so don't be worried, right? Then I tell them, well, also this bald hair doesn't come because I used the wrong shampoo, right? So it comes because my genetics, for whatever reason, is in this sense. And to be frank, we didn't find out why some people have a bald hair and the other ones don't have it. Of course, we know testosterone is involved in this, but we know on the other hand for depression, there is also some hormones involved with this. But we know with depression at least as much as we know from the bald hair. We have also to state that the current treatments help too few patients to get better. When you think about all the money spent for oncology, for hematology, of course, it's important but these treatments help still not uh, too many patients when it comes to depression. And a very important point is also, we need to include research findings in daily practice. I think this seminar is part of it that we should think about the research findings for daily practice. Let me give you an example. When you think in a very psychodynamic way, about depression, a problem in the oral phase, for instance. You know, psychoanalysis is very important, of course, right? If you have this theory behind, then you would soon come to talk about the mother of the patients and about the nutrition and how the mother was with the patient to explain depression. And at, at the end of the session, at the end of 10 sessions, at the end of 20, 30, 50 sessions, the patient understands a little bit about the relationship to the mother, but still is, is depressed, unfortunately. However, when you think, well, depression comes from a problem in the hypothalamic region, including also the amygdala nucleus, then you start talking differently. And you say to the patient, well, right now you're in a depressive state. You shouldn't encounter too many problems, which you might have, you rather 
keep them for the time when you're feeling better. So this is just one way how to explain the underlying biology. Of course, the relationship to the mother <coughs> is very important, but tell, let me tell you, I'm now 40 years psychiatrist working in different university settings, Heidelberg, Germany, National Institute of Mental Health in Washington, DC, and now since uh, over a quarter of a century in Vienna, in my depressed patients, I couldn't find any cause that the mother uh, relationship, for instance, or some early life experience was, uh, was um, uh, connected to the medical issue of depression. If there is a problem, usually this comes out in addictive disorders, and but not in the depression which we have. So when we call this depression sort of kind of things and not tie it into brain health, it puts also a stigma to our psychiatric patients. And I think we need to fight this stigma. And I think a good way to fight it, to talk about brain health, like in other diseases also, it's called like uh, uh, muscle health or other kind of things. Let me continue with this. I think probably some of you, but not all of you are aware there is a quiet re revolution in science. And when you heard from Professor Mingxi before, the CIMP World Congress, which unfortunately was not in beautiful Taipei, it was virtual, but you heard a lot of things which were happening and that is a lack of spreading. It doesn't come out so clearly to the psychiatrists and the field but on the other hand, the, uh, the, uh, the, the researchers, they start that early treatment of depression and dementia is possible to have prevention. And we are working on like personalized or precision psychiatric treatments with predictive properties. And uh, it's interesting that also for the first time, Institutions are launching like brain health projects, including psychiatric diseases, like in Canada is the brain health movement, brain medicine. I think in, um, in Asian countries, like when I was in Hong Kong, you hear about brain medicine. And here in Vienna, we have a so-called neuroscience cluster where we put together neurology, neurosurgery, psychiatry, then also other parts <coughs> with the Brain Institute to, under, to find out the translational properties. So this was kind of my introduction to depression, which keeps also the focus on brain health, which I find very important. This would be the five parts of the uh, uh, medical neuroscience cluster, which I just reported to you. And if you have interest, please go to the homepage cluster midunivin.ac.at uh, slash mnc, then you hear more about these different activities, how these different centers work together. Then we come to the diagnosis. When I started psychiatry in the mid 70s, the DSM was a very small booklet, you know, it was not over 100 pages, but now at DSM 5, it gets really big. So sometimes uh, the, 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 the young colleagues say, why do I have to learn all these diseases? You know, everybody gets nowadays an SSRI and gets on the other hand, also so-called atypical antipsychotics on top of it. Why do we have all these different diseases? I think the different diagnosis went a little bit too far, I have to say, and specifically for depression, there is a huge widening of the diagnosis. So when you have all these DSM-5 diagnoses, then you might end up with too many depressed patients, which are not really uh, the case in reality. So <clears throat> what is the symptomatology? I think the symptomatology you see very clearly is of course, depressed mood or irritability. And the other hand is marked loss of interest and pleasure. These are the core symptoms of depression. 
And on the other hand, you find also psychomotor agitation, hypersomnia or insomnia, then appetite changes increased or decreased, appetite weight. There's an interesting uh, biology behind increased or decreased appetite, which needs to be looked more carefully in this. Also the weight, body mass index. would like to tell you, we looked at a large group of patients and found that if they have a too high BMI, the outcome is very bad for these patients. Of course, psychomotor retardation, suicidal ideation, lack of energy, which is lost also to the, it's also linked to the loss of interest, then guilt feelings and um, also impaired concentration are important. So right now we are in the phase of deconstructing also depression and very likely we will find some biological also underpinnings for patients, for instance, with increased appetite opposed to those with decreased appetite or patients with suicidal ideation or patients with concentration difficulties. I'm quite sure there will not be a development right now for the whole group of depression with regard to therapy, but rather a deconstructed uh, a precision therapy for different kinds of these patient characteristics. Let me once more explain to you, because I think it's very important when you also speak to your colleagues, and that's also how I explain my patient, the physiology versus the illness. Like if you go up the stairs in a faster manner, like if Professor Ming-Chi goes up the stairs to building 101, I'm quite sure after which floor, but after she will have an increased heartbeat, right? Ming-Chi, would you agree to this? <laughs> Probably after the 15th or 20th floor. I have it already after the second or third floor, right? But if Professor Ming-Chi or Professor Kasper myself get rhythm disturbance, like extra systoles or whatever, then we are talking about an illness. So this is very important. Like also right now in the COVID pandemic, we have, of course, more depressive feelings, more anxiety feelings. Interestingly, in the younger population, which means up to the age of 40, you have this increased symptomatology. But as a matter of fact, you do not have increased rates of depression right now. As a matter of fact, my depressed patient, they say, oh, doctor, that's quite a good time because not everybody is so hectic right now. So they are pretty much like I am self, they stay at home, don't make too much activity. So depression itself doesn't increase. However, the symptomatology, the physiology increases like symptoms of anxiety. So, and in a, in a standardized ways, for instance, if we do the serotonin or norepinephrine depletion test, we can also induce some depressive symptomatology as has been shown from our colleagues Delgado, but also from my group here in Vienna. So keep in mind, physiology versus illness. So increased heartbeat after exercise and rhythm disturbance after illness. And of course, in depression, I will show you some examples we have a large number of biological variables which are changed, which unfortunately cannot be used as biological markers because still the phenotype, how the patient presents to you, is much stronger than all these biological variables. Let me tell you that uh, important figures of Vienna looked also at this analogy, like Sigmund Freud he wrote in this famous article, Grief and Melancholia. He wrote, the shadow of the object falls on the ego. That's, of course, a wonderful exp uh, uh, expression of melancholia. And Sigmund Freud also said, with my method, I cannot treat melancholia. But the colleagues after him, they forgot this. And they thought they can treat melancholia with this method. But... I am self, myself a trained psychoanalyst lying down for six years on the couch. 
It was quite good for my understanding, but soon I could realize I cannot treat this melancholia with this treatment. So, and Sigmund Freud pointed out, Viktor Frankl, the other one, very important existential and logotherapist, therapist, which I happen to know also in person. And he died, unfortunately, in 1997, when he told me, when he talked to Sigmund Freud, were interesting points, which they said. He had an interesting system. He called it the spiritual person. He called it the noetic dimension, which means the very personal situation like I myself, if I meet people who I didn't meet for 40, 50 years, they say, oh, Siegfried, you have less hair, but you have uh, less, you have more weight, right, probably, but you're still the same, you know, you still have your personality that he called the noetic dimension. And he says, well, this noetic dimension rests behind the wall of the disease. He said, well, the disease is a wall. And I think this is a very nice picture, how he pointed it out. Because if you just talk to the noetic dimension of the patient, yeah, then you might do have to pull him over the, the wall. But if you try to do this, it's probably not possible. And he wrote further in his book in 1954, the better the psychosocial condition of a patient is, the better is the communication of the patient with the environment. I think to consider the wall of the illness is a very important issue and is quite often forgotten when we only talk about the noetic dimension. Of course, we need to reach out to the person with the noetic dimension. For instance, if somebody is very much inclined to flowers and garden, then you talk, of course, about flowers and garden, but please do not expect that the wall of the illness will be lowered by when you talk about the flowers and the garden. Or like if a man, if you talk about sports like soccer or basketball, and this is the spiritual person which needs to be connected, but it does not reduce the wall of the illness. That's quite important. So these are the forefathers being a more simple minded person. I wrote a paper together with my colleague uh, Kranz, who is now in Hong Kong, and he, we wrote a book, uh, an article about the suitability of medical analogies, how I use it. So like depression is a broken leg and the long-term treatment of depression is like hypertension. Of course, you need to treat uh, depression for a long time, but that's the same like in hypertension and you would not get rid of the hypertensive medication when you have a correct uh, blood pressure. But unfortunately, in depression, very often, they say, now you feel better, so let's get rid of your medication. So that's a very bad thing. When the patient says, oh, doctor, uh, <coughs> it takes already four weeks. I'm with you. Why isn't it going better? Austria, you know, is a skiing nation, and we have a lot of broken legs, you know, also from our ski races. Then I, for instance, I said, Hermann Mayer, who is a famous skier, he broke his leg and he was out of business for one year. And I told him, well, if you're out of business for one year, just breaking your leg, can you imagine when you have some problem with the brain, which is of course much more complicated than a leg? Well, if you're out of business then for a longer time, that's how the biology works. So usually when I take this analogy of broken leg and hypertension, I have the feeling that patients start to understand their depression or their relatives or the partners of the patients, they start to understand. So if you have a chance, please have a look at this article on the suitability of medical analogies. But if you want to have more um, sophistication, please go back to Sigmund Freud and Viktor Frankl. But it's always the same issue about physiology and disease on the other hand. So let's continue. I think it's very important that we need to integrate psychiatry, what our forefathers have written. And with great pleasure, <coughs> I read always the old books of psychiatry, like uh, Ernst von Feuchters Leben in Austria or uh, other books, because they describe their patients very carefully. Emil Krippelin, for instance, when I worked in Heidelberg at the university, I could go down to the archives 
and get out the, the, the charts which Emil Kreppelin wrote in these days, or Karl Jaspers wrote in these days and handwritten, you could see what they wrote down. It's a beautiful description of the patients. Unfortunately, they couldn't help that much because there was no treatment and they tried to develop some psychotherapy. But the biggest push nowadays, I think, will come from neuroscience and we need to integrate these points. I think it would be wrong to forget what our forefathers have been written and also to forget the forms of psychotherapy, but we need to integrate it with the new findings in neuroscience. So what's going on in the brain? This uh, cartoon was drawn by my dear colleague <laughs> over 40 years ago. In these days, can you imagine? We didn't have a CT scan, no CT scan in these days, right? No MRI, no PET scans, nothing, right? And he said to me, oh, Siegfried, <coughs> we cannot look in this brain. This is impossible. In these days, we used some neuroendocrine measurements, which I show you. And nowadays, we have understanding that we can look at neuroendocrine measurements, neurogenesis, <coughs> very important when you think about the whole ketamine story, for instance, right now, the neurotransmitters with serotonin, dopamine, noepinephrine, of course, has been used quite a lot of time. Neurosecretory is a quite important issue because the different brain areas do not talk to each other in the same amount as they should do. And of course, the genetic point is a very important one, of course. In Europe, genetics is, was not considered good, specifically in Germany and Austria, because in the Nazi time, you know, due to genetic situation, a lot of psychiatric patients were even killed because they thought, well, that is not uh, worth living. Neuroinflammation is an, also another area which we learn more with the COVID crisis. And keep in mind, the COVID uh, um, the virus goes also into the brain. We know this from mouse brain. We know this from post-mortem brains. We know, unfortunately, this is the inflammation taking play in a place in the brain. So right now, the biggest, I think, um, a change will come from understanding neurogenesis, neuropsychiatry, and neuroinflammation. I think the time of neurotransmitters is kind of out. We shouldn't forget them, but I think we studied them very carefully. This is a, a, a scheme which showed you that uh, should show you that um, a depression is not only a problem of the hypothalamus. Of course, there is a problem in the hypothalamus and also in the thalamus and also in the pituitary axis, which goes then down to uh, increase cortisol. It's a systemic disorder, but it, it's substantiated in the brain. And you probably uh, also witnessed that patients coming to you with depression and high blood pressure, and you treat them for depression, then soon they say, well, but high blood pressure is also solved. So this is because depression is a systemic disorder and needs to be treated properly, also with the primary organ, that's the brain. I was talking about neuroendocrinology. I just would like to show you one, uh, one graph, which is very important, published from Linkowski and Mendlevich in 1987, quite a while ago. But I'm always impressed that this is nearly forgotten with the younger colleagues. But in these days, we thought, well, this is the way to the brain. When the patients were acutely depressed, they took blood samples continuously. And you see the shaded line would be the healthy controls and the uh, yellow line would be the depressed patients. And you see in the morning hours, the, the, the cortisol level are like double as high as in healthy controls. In the afternoon hours, when the HPA axis is quietescent, there is no problem. Then in nighttime, and then it starts again in the morning to have a higher cortisol level. And when the patients are remitted, this is luckily not the case anymore. I think this article is very important because we know that the, the hippocampus, for instance, does not like high cortisol. It stops neurogenesis. We know like from the Munich department, when they looked at treatment-resistant depression, 
and Professor Frodel, Professor Müller was substantiated in this, they could see smaller hippocampal volumes when the patients were in a not remitted state. So keep in mind, depression is toxic. And when the patient said, oh, do the medication change my personality, tell them, usually hormones are well considered and they say, well, the hormones uh, it is too high and your brain doesn't like high hormones. I just for historical reasons, I would like to stress, in these days, there was also the dexamethasone suppression test was a big hype 30 years ago and thought this is a biological marker, but unfortunately, it was not so useful. Keep in mind, that's acute depression, that's broken leg, and this is hypertension on the right side. Nowadays, we work in also the brain imaging facilities and Taipei has also a wonderful brain imaging facilities with Professor Tom Zhu. I visited him uh, quite a while ago in his department when he was still active. This is a summary of our work, which we did. And you see here would be structural alterations. Here would be functional alterations. When there is a blue color, then there is a decreased structural or function when there is a reddish color it's an increased uh, 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 function there is no increased structure of course when there is a purple color there are in inconsistent results but you see there are some areas they are decreased like the ventromedial prefrontal cortex for instance or the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex but when you go to function you see there are some areas they have higher activation and some areas have lower activation. I think this is very important because the different brain structures, they do not talk uh, to each other in the same way like they should do. And you might be astonished to see there is a number of areas like the striatum or the insular cortex or the posterior insular cortex where there's higher activity. So keep in mind, there is a structure, a lower structure on the one hand side, but on the other hand, also a higher activity and the different brain areas do not talk to each other in the same way as they should do. When we come one layer uh, closer from the structure and the function to the different neurotransmitter levels, here you see a serotonin synapse and you see one of the important structures, the serotonin transporter. And um, in Vienna, we were one of the first to measure the serotonin transporter in our uh, depressed patients in the 90s. And we found there's a lower activity. In the old days, we gave them like some fenfluramine and looked at the different hormonal response and also found there's a lower serotonergic activity. The other structure is the Mayo activity, monamine oxidase activity, and needless to say, the SSRIs, they block the serotonin transporter and the Mayo inhibitor, they block the monamine oxidase. Quite important issue, like the blockade of the serotonin transporter now have 90 to 95% of all of the medication worldwide. The Mayo inhibitor, still one of the strongest medication which we have, tranylcypromine, but unfortunately, too many side effects, but we shouldn't forget that the Mayo activity is a very important issue. This has been uh, shown here in a work published in the Archives of General Psychiatry, which we did together with the Clark Institute in Toronto. And you see the open triangles would be the healthy subjects and the closed triangle would be depressed subjects. And you see in all these different areas, prefrontal cortex, temporal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and so on and so forth. Depressed patients always have higher Mayo activity as measured with positron emission tomography. The ligand was harmine. So giving a Mayo inhibitor is a very physiological uh, thing to do because it lowers the increased Mayo activity of the depressed patients. Of course, the serotonin uh, system is not so simple, like only the serotonin transporter. There are a lot of other transporters and also uh, receptors pre and postsynaptically. So 
a lot of work to do. The most important right now is, as I said, the serotonin transporter, where the medication, the SSRIs, the tricyclics work, but also fenfluramine, then 5-HT2, 5-HT1, and the 5-HT3 receptor postsynaptically, and also the 5-HT1A presynaptically are important. Nowadays, we can measure these receptors like we do here in Vienna, the reddish color means always there is more of this activity. The bluish color is less activity. You see here the serotonin transporter in the midbrain areas here, and then the 5-HT2A in the temporal lobe, the 5-HT2-1A also in the temporal lobe. They are co-expressed at the same site. And I do not show you pictures right now. In our depressed patients, there is reduced activity of 5-HT1A, 5-HT2A, and also reduced activity of serotonin transporter. Like in mouse experiments, if you have a knockout mouse and you knock out the 5-HT1A receptor, then you have a very anxious mouse. So the mouse model works very good. And in our medication, we increase the 5-HT1A receptor binding. <coughs> You might be astonished to see this article here since we use so many SSRIs worldwide. So a few years ago, we put together the different studies which were looking at the serotonin transporter in our, um, in, 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 in our patients. And you know, only this number of page, uh, publications found there is altogether a lower activity of the serotonin transporter in the RAFE nuclei here. This is everything also dependent on the time of the year. There's a whole variety of different kind of findings. In summertime, you have higher activity and in wintertime, you have lower activity. So I think that um, we, we looked also at different uh, predictive values and uh, looking at the serotonin activity in the RAFE nuclei then we could find those patients with a responder and non-responder and remitter. And then we could see that the activity in this RAFE nuclei was linked to the remitter activity, <coughs> indicating those patients who did not have a change in this RAFE nuclei did also not have a response in their pathology. These are basic science results, which of course cannot be done in everyday clinical practice. There is no need for, do, for doing it, but I think the background is very important. Let me finish up the biology just with the limbic system, which I find so important for understanding. You see once more here the hippocampus, you see the amygdala, and you need to see the olfactory bulb where our coronavirus now sneaks into the brain and will spread all the pathology over this brain. And when we try to understand the feeling of our patients, we show them happy faces, angry, astonished faces, different kinds of faces. And we try to look what this emotion does in the brain. And as a control group, we give them some geometric figures. And then you see, of course, the patients they and the controls, they see these figures over here and it travels through the amygdala here. And when we look then, if we give, when we give them some medication, then you see this goes here to the amygdala, a very important structure. Here, there are smaller points. So that means that this is occupied by the SSRI. And when you see the figures, you see that would be the placebo condition. Here would be the SSRI condition with citalopram or escitalopram. You see a reduction. In practical mean, when the patient says, for instance, oh, doctor, how can this small pill take care of all my sorrows and anxiety feelings? Well, then we have to tell them it's a very potent medication which goes to structures right in the middle of the brain which are responsible for regulating mood and anxiety. With this, I think I am done with the underlying biology. And I would like to give my word back to our distinguished chairman, Professor Ming-Chi Huang. She will probably uh, 
ask uh, allowed to ask some questions. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for uh, Professor Kasper's <laughs> um, um, sharing of all the underlying knowledge of the uh, depression. And uh, Professor Kasper is very capable of explaining profound theories in simple language. So uh, I guess all of us will uh, have learned a lot of the underlying uh, pathophysiology of um, in depression. So there are some questions coming in. So um, let's take um, one or two questions from the uh, from the bottom line uh, Q and A box. So one audience um, asked about um, the the antidepressant effects on personality. Um, like uh, uh, one audience said, uh, is there any way that uh, um, depression um, the narcissistic personality could be altered by the antidepressant. Mm -hmm. So what's your thoughts on that? No, very Kostner? important. So depressed patients have a specific personality structure, which were called in the German psychopathology uh, um, uh, typus melancholicus. I think this is a term which nearly forgot. So when I ask patients with a depression, they usually have... Um, this uh, the, the American uh, DSM five, uh, uh, four and five called it cluster C personality. Usually they are avoidant personalities. Usually mm -hmm. they do not like to have fights with somebody. And usually they concerned very much about rules and also about like being clean. So uh, when you ask a patient, well, when you were a, a student, uh, did you ask critical questions to your teacher or did you question, for instance, the, the policeman uh, when he the, they said, no, no, I tried to avoid any confrontation. I always wanted to be in harmony. So sometimes we think these patients are addictive of harmony. So narcissistic personality, usually they are not because narcissistic personality would mean that they have illusions how great they are. They don't have these illusions how great they are. They have, they have very, very much concerned about everything should be clean in their house. Sometimes I ask them, well, could we eat on the floor of your house? They say, oh yeah, my house is so clean, you can eat on the floor, right? So this is of course uh, not possible in Europe, right? And, but they are very uh, on harmon. So de definitely uh, narcissistic characteristics are not the, the mainstay of depressed patients. And if they are, they cannot be cured with antidepressants. If somebody has too much narcissistic uh, points, then I would give them a low dose of like so-called D2, 5-HT2 blockers, which were called like second generation antipsychotics, like 0.5 milligrams, for instance, of um, risperidone or five to five milligrams of aripiprazole that could take a little bit care of the narcissistic because narcissistic pro persons have a lot of problems with the environment because not too many people understand and like them due to their narcissistic properties. Wow. Wow. Thank you for uh, this in-depth answers. But uh, because limited, limited of time, we have to stop here for a break for about, um, what do you say, five minutes? Because everybody is aware that uh, uh, Professor Cosper is, uh, is coughing from time to time. I think we all, uh, we all need to let Professor Cosper a little bit time for um, the water and some hydration. So I will see you later uh, in five minutes. Is that okay? Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Minji. So, good morning, uh, um, morning. So, so the next part of the uh, depression will be tapping on the uh, treatment part. So I will see you later, guys, in five minutes. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this webinar. This is the second part of uh, depression, which is um, which is given by Professor Kasper from uh, Vienna, and uh, he has given us a lot of knowledge 
about the pathophysiology of depression. So in the second half, we are moving to the treatment on the, or, and the, the pharmacotherapy, pharmacotherapy of depression. So let's welcome Professor Cosper. In the first part, I was talking about depression, the epidemiology, the understanding of the depression, and also the biology. And now let's come to the second part, which is the treatment part, which is based, of course, on the thoughts which I have uh, transmitted before. I would like to start with the first slide, which is a very nice meta-analysis of different other meta-analysis, and it encompasses medication used for internal medicine. Those are the, the open circles on the left side. And uh, you see on the right-hand side, those are the meta-analysis confirmed from studies with psychiatric medication. And you see that uh, the medication work as good what we use in psychiatry as they are used in general medicine. And when you look at the different effect sizes, then by numbers, they even work a little bit better. So please convey to your colleagues or to your other people that psychiatric medication work very good. They are also so-called number needed to treat, which are out like five or six for antidepressants. So they can be effectively used and also safely used. On the other hand, there are also terrible books about antidepressants. And those books, for instance, are not available for treating patients with hypertension or thyroid disease. And you see, they are, should be toxic. They should be the new emperors, new drugs, and so on and so forth. We are lucky that Professor Funtulakis from the Thessaloniki University wrote a very good book, a good book chapter, and also an article together with Professor Muller. And he found out, of course, that those scientific articles, like from Irving Kirsch, is one of the colleagues here uh, who write also articles, they did some miscalculation. And so we should be thankful for this correction. Antidepressants started in the 50s by Ronald Kuhn, who used imidazo benzyl derivat and tofranilin called in these days. You have to see that the first paper was published in German language in the Swiss Medical Journal. And uh, thereafter, all of these articles, different medication were published in English language. You see in the 60s, there were the tricyclic antidepressants, but also the Mayo inhibitors, which I showed you before. Keep in mind that we did not have any clue about the underlying biology of serotonin, noepinephrine. So the first brain imaging results have been done in the 90s after the introduction of the SSRIs. And importantly, Research gets uh, focused on the different things when there is uh, some effective treatment. Like right now, we have ketamine, and ketamine will fuel the whole glutamatergic hypothesis of depression. And when you look at the literature, you rarely find any biological publication focusing on the serotonin transporter because that was the old days. And you see on this slide also, we have a large number of medication. When my patients are out of depression, I tell them, well, luckily you have one of these psychiatric diseases where we have actually the best medication available. You know, we have also medication available for treatment of schizophrenia, but when you think about addiction, we hardly have any medication available for them. But here you have the three psychics, the SSRIs, the dual acting. Then you have the ivomelatine, which has a completely different mechanism of action. Then even atypical antipsychotics in a lower dosage are working. And the new kid on the block is the glutamatergic system, which I will touch at the end of my talk uh, more thoroughly. I was talking about the World Congress of the CIMP 
to be taking place in beautiful Taipei, Taiwan. Unfortunately, when we had like two years ago, uh, ago the, the planning meeting, Professor Ming Chi, you probably remember, we had a lot of symposia on ketamine and glutamine. So we had to uh, throw out uh, so many because we said, well, otherwise it would not be a World Congress of Psychopharmacology, it would be a World Congress of glutamatergic and system and uh, ketamine. So this is now affecting a lot of research and I think rightly it affects a lot of research because that's a new treatment avenue with a stronger and more effective treatment. If you want to read about the different studies with exception of ketamine, please go down to the World Journal of Biological Psychiatry, the a group of Bauer from Germany together with other colleagues, they published these guidelines and this I think is very helpful for understanding. What I took out of these guidelines is the so-called treatment algorithm. You look uh, if there is a partial or non-response to two to four weeks with an antidepressant at adequate dosage. Well, you can consider a treatment optimization, like a dose increase. What we do in Vienna, for instance, we measure the blood level of this medication. And those patients visiting us in the Department of Psychiatry, about eight to 10% are so-called ultra rapid metabolizers, which have not a sufficient level of medication. Then it can be combined with two antidepressants from different classes like SSRIs plus mirtazapine or SSRIs plus trazodone. It doesn't make sense to combine two SSRIs because it always goes to the same structure. Augmentation means, for instance, with an atypical antipsychotic or with lithium or nowadays add-on strategy with esketamine and switching should be the least uh, kind of a situation just when a patient only has side effects and doesn't have any effect at all. You see also the levels of evidence that was looked at different uh, studies types. So the highest level of evidence is placebo controlled, reference controlled studies, that's level A, then B would be only placebo controlled and C would be more clinical experience. So you see that combining two antidepressants in these days, 2013 had level C. Nowadays we have some other articles like from Professor Pierre Blier, for instance. So it would go up to level B because there are better antidepressants available. What is also, I think, very important that adding psychotherapy should be allowed at any time during the treatment. I do not like these um, treatment algorithms like the NICE guidelines, for instance, from UK or the German guidelines. Unfortunately, they say, well, there is mild, moderate and severe depression, mild depression, only psychotherapy, moderate psychotherapy plus medication and severe only medication. I think this speaks against every clinical practice because of course severe depressed patients also need psychotherapy but a very specific medical psychotherapy for their patients. Also ECT should be considered at any time. It doesn't make sense to say to the patient well for instance if the patient says well doctor I responded beautifully in the last episode seven years ago to ECT please give me ECT now and you say well no your Hamilton is 18 it's not high enough and we first have to use this and this and this medication when the patient says he has a good response before and this is also documented in the charts I would give him also ECT at any time during the treatment and do not let him suffer until uh, the depression gets worse. Let me show you also a chart from Europe uh, where you see the European study group of treatment resistant depression which was founded like over 20 years ago by Professor Mendlevich, um, Professor Montgomery and myself. And you see here the different centers which are involved. And you see the Brussels with Mendlevich, then you see Paris. Unfortunately, Yves Le Crubier died in between, then Geneva, then Germany, then Italy, then Greece, and also Tel Aviv in Israel. And over the years, 
we published quite a large number of papers and um, we gathered all together like 2,700 patients. When I put together these slides were 2,700. Right now, this figure goes up to 3,000 because we have more to go. Why is this so important? Uh, because this European study group recruits both in university and non-university recruitment centers, including inpatients and outpatients, and it reflects a real world sample of depressed patients seeking treatment and they exhibit a broad range of disease severity and course. There are no exclusion criteria like in most of the randomized controlled trials. So suicidality as well as mental and somatic comorbidities are included and therefore we can speak also on this real world sample procedure. So this was be recently summarized in this paper by our colleague, Dr. Bartova from my department together with the group. So if you have some further interest, please go down to this article or please send me an email. I'm happy to send this article to you. The story, to make the story short, the clinical characteristics, which I show you later, they beat unfortunately the biological characteristics by far. So when we come with clinical characteristics, which I show you, then of course, the biological genetic characteristics are important, but they are not usable for everyday clinical practice. So what did we find? We found clinical parameters. If a patient has depression and anxiety disorder, like panic disorder, social phobia, and has melancholic features or has suicide risk, or a severe depressed patient, didn't respond to the first antidepressant and had an early onset of action. These were the clinical factors which always popped out to be very important. When we looked at different biological genetic factors, we looked at SNPs and we looked at the BDNF, the brain derived neurotropic factor, polymorphism, and you see this kind of uh, polymorphism popped out then the PPP3CC, that's a kind of uh, inflammatory parameter popped out. Then the 5-HT2A uh, polymorphism popped out. 5-H2A is insofar important because that's the structure where also the atypical and antipsychotics go. Then the CMT, that's the degradating enzyme for the neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and also this structure, which is linked to pseudo-architectural structures. So these factors popped out from genetic, but uh, you cannot use one of them like the BDNF and you cannot use one of the other ones. So we thought, why, why don't we combine these two and look at a kind of technical uh, uh, procedure, statistical called machine learning. And when we did this, we found out that melancholic features together with the 5-HT2A they, they were uh, statistically significant, but unfortunately not relevant for everyday clinical practice. It would be, of course, wonderful to have a kind of a molecular diagnosis plus clinical parameters, but hopefully we will have this in the near future because now we were lucky and have the whole genome from the population available. And we are confirming right now a study and um, try to understand this further. This brings me to the point that um, the NIH, uh, spearheaded by uh, Tom Insel and Cuthbert in Science, published in 2015, that we need to deconstruct depression. At, uh, I think everybody agrees that depression is too broad disorder, like also bipolar depression, dysthymia goes into it, and we should break it down by genetic risk, brain activity, physiology, behavioral process, life experience, and make specific clusters out of this. And very likely these clusters then will uh, have a better response to treatment than when we just take major depressive disorder like outlined over here. So it would be wonderful to have a kind of a precision medicine of responders, non-responders re resistant because right now we treat all of these over here the same way. And every clinician knows, well, probably this alcoholic depressed patient 
needs another medication than this overweight lady here. Like she will not uh, benefit from mirtazapine, just making her more heavy. Probably he or this gentleman will respond to mirtazapine and very likely this old lady also to mirtazapine because this looks better in this situation, but we do not have a genetic marker as yet available. When we look at different clinical variables, again, what I showed before uh, by machine learning, there are several characteristics popping out like chronicity is one, then the number of major depressive episodes, the age at first onset of major depressive, then age, the older, the, better, the worst, then the age of the last major depressive episode. These were the most important factors to on a clinical level, which can be easily detected also. So this brings us together and because that was the first study and when we looked at two studies together, then we could say, well, this kind of a replication study that the prominent risk factors are symptom severity, suicidal risk, higher number of lifetime depressive episodes, comorbid anxiety disorders. These are clinically easy to detect symptomatology and usually not always asked in everyday clinical practice what of course they could be do done. And those are the patients who are at risk for treatment resistant depression. This was the European sample. When we just look over the ocean to our North American sample to the STAR D study, then if you look at the level one, you could see that those patients with anxious depression, they did not do as good as non-anxious patient when they were treated with the SSRI citalopram, both in the response and in the remission factory. So it's not only a European story, it's also a North American story. And I would be interested to hear, I'm quite sure it's the same also in the Asian population. One question which uh, struck us and we looked at, what about uh, uh, if psycho did the patients who were treatment resistant, did they receive psychotherapy? Interestingly, in this European sample, which I showed you, Belgium, Germany, Austria, Italy, France, like uh, around 70%, like two thirds didn't receive additional specific psychotherapy. This is insofar astonishing because nowadays you read always that psychotherapy should be applied to everybody, but we shouldn't forget when we psychiatrists talk to our patients, of course, this is also psychotherapy, it's medical psychotherapy and should not be under-evaluated. Well, what kind of psychotherapy did they get? The majority got like cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, which is a kind of a manual driven psychotherapy some of them got also like psychoanalytic therapy or systemic psychotherapy. When we looked then, well, did the cognitive behavioral psychotherapy help them to prevent also uh, uh, to get treatment resistant? It's a very clear picture here that no additional psychotherapy did not significantly change the picture so it did not change the picture if you were a responder or a non-responder or treatment resistant in our European sample. I think this is an eye opener and indicates also that treatment resistant depression is very likely a more biological grounded disease specifically. We looked also, what about is the occupational level of our patient? And it's usually thought when you have a high occupational level, you have more money and then you can do better. But it was not in our case that a high occupational level, it was the case that high occupational level was associated with a poorer response to treatment. In, in our paper, we discussed this uh, also in terms of when you have a higher occupational level, you need more cognition for your work and cognition is of course impaired in your in our patients so high occupational level keep in mind is not associated with a good response for treatment of depression <laughs>
what kind of medication did the patients get here from the same sample and you see that patients got antidepressants but we were interested what kind of additional medication did the patients get and you see like one third they got benzodiazepines and related drug additionally to their antidepressants this is insofar important because there are some countries say well you never should give benzodiazepines but it indicates that doctors want to help their patients and give them benzodiazepines. So we need to work on the GABA receptor. And there's, as a matter of fact, new medication that Brexanolol, for instance, is going to be studied for treatment-resistant depression, which hopefully will also close the gap which medication we should use. Then antidepressants, additionally, with a different mechanism of action, that would be like trazodone and mirtazapine, one third of them, and antipsychotics, 24%, for the whole sample. When we only looked at the inpatient sample, this figure would go up to 50%. Mood stabilizers, mostly lithium, and also pregabalin was used in these patients. In the last part of my talk, I would like to stress once more, quite importantly, the synaptic plasticity of depression and I would like to stress these articles which came out of the Yale group from uh, Duman and Agachanian, but also from the Hong Kong colleague from Professor Lee, when they took animals and stressed them and then treated them with uh, a ketamine, they found a synaptogenesis. Here it's displayed like this, that you have stress-induced spine loss and when you treat them with a glutamatergic compound, then you have a better spine formation. And this goes within minutes. It doesn't take weeks. It goes within minutes. That's quite important. Here's the paper from Dr. Lee in control and ketamine. And this is also uh, in line with the clinical data when we give ketamine as infusion or nowadays with a nasal spray. Here's the old work from Makarov when he look, uh, used uh, like a ketamine and uh, two times, uh, three times in these days in a week, and he could find then a nice response in the, within four hours, which lasted then for another 24 hours. And it was repeated, there was a constant and remission. This is just one of the older paper. Dr. Sarate from the NIH made also a number of papers and needless to say, you're probably aware that Janssen Company developed intranasal formulation, which is much easier to apply and um, helps the patients to get out of the depression. And um, interestingly, nowadays, the psychiatrists, they say, why do we need this intranasal blah, blah, blah? At the same time, there is an intranasal formulation for coming out for diabetes. So the doctors of internal medicine are very happy to have this compound. Psychiatrists are still hesitant. Interestingly, then in US, but also in Europe, anesthesiologists take it over and give uh, this medication to their patients. So I think we should be aware that we do not lose our depressed patients to other professions, quite importantly. In Vienna, we looked also on the underlying biology of this esketamine response, and we looked at the hippocampus, and we gave like quite a low dosage in these days, uh, 25 milligrams, which is below the therapeutical efficacy dosage. And we could find a significant increase of hippocampal structures, in this case, healthy controls. Quite importantly, we thought we find some differences in the subgroups of the hippocampus, but unfortunately didn't find it. But the overall efficacy was here for the hippocampal structures. So this is, uh, to my understanding, one of the first data also in human beings, which has been shown before in animal research, which I showed you before. So the ketamine, esketamine response has a biological basis, needless to say. Then the question is, uh, I go back, um, uh, which is used in clinical practice also, what about second generation antipsychotics or D2, 5-HT2 antipsychotics and lithium, which is better? It seems like a, a case of religion, this one or the other one is better. So the European database clearly indicates, here are the light uh, 
the 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 the, the light uh, blue are the second generation antipsychotics. The dark blue would be the lithium augmentation. They are sign they are significantly better with the Montgomery Asplex scale or the Hamilton depression scale. When you ask me why do you plot two different scales here, they are the same. No, the Hamilton has more sedative items. They have six points for the sedation, for instance. So, of course, then, uh, since the second generation anti, uh, antipsychotics like quetiapine or like olanzapine have some sedative components that would be in favor when you measure it with the Hamilton score, but with the Montgomery Asplex score has uh, just one item. So it's pretty much the same. So for clinical purposes, keep in mind, second generation antipsychotics work better than lithium. Uh, there's, well, I'm aware and I'm a co-author of one study where we compared quetiapine with lithium Again, quetiapine was uh, superior to lithium augmentation. Then what about the question, esketamine nasal spray to second generation antipsychotics? We took the database, which was submitted to the FDA on second generation antipsychotics, which was quetiapine, aripiprazole, and the olanzapine fluoxetine combination. And we co compared it to the esketamine nasal spray, which again, the database, which was sent to the FDA, and you see the effect size is like double as high, indicating that esketamine nasal spray works um, uh, at least double as good. That would be also my clinical experience with this medication. The Institute of Psychiatry in London, um, the group of Alan Young uh, put together a nice review and compared mood stabilizers, antipsychotics and NMDA antagonists you see clearly antipsychotics are better studied than lithium uh, uh, mood stabilizers. There are a number of lithium uh, trials, but they're only open trials. And those are the double blind trials. And you see here the trials with NMDA antagonist, which is esketamine. Then you see they come to the evidence that's low evidence, medium and high level. So mood stabilizers, I personally am not in favor of using lithium unless the patient has some bipolar traits. Then I think the, the lithium is a good medication. Antipsychotics, well, they work, but still have some metabolic problems. Some of them with the antipsychotics, I prefer like aripiprazole and also in elderly population, probably olanzapine, but I am aware also of the cognitive impairment of this medication. So I think the NMDA antagonist is the good new way to look at this treatment response. Recently, we published a treatment pathway in the World Journal of Biological Psychiatry because you're aware that the esketamine is now studied as a third line treatment. And unless we have other data available, we should use it also a third line treatment starting like I showed you before from the WFSPP guidelines, the first line treatment is inadequate response to the first antidepressants, then increase those. If there is a response, continue. Second line, pretty much the same combination, antidepressant treatment, augmentation, switch present, and third line treatment. The new situation is the esketamine nasal spray and oral antidepressant. Keep in mind, esketamine has only been studied together as an add-on strategy to oral antidepressant. Again, psychotherapy and non-pharmacological therapies like ECT, TMS may be considered at any point during the treatment pathway. This is also in the work journal of biological psychiatry together with my colleagues from Poland, Italy, Spain, Belgium, and the UK. Looking at the future, which medications are right now in development? You see the red ones, they made it already on the market, esketamine and brexanolol, brexanolol for postpartum depression, esketamine for treatment-resistant depression. There are some medication who did not make it, like here this rapastinel, but they are right now looking for suicidality. But what is important? When you look at the mechanism of action, there is no such thing as the serotonergic system or the noradrenergic system. It always deals with the NMDA receptor or the GABA receptor, glutamate release. So 
This will be the future for the next years and hopefully will help us to better understand the underlying biology. With this, I thank you for your attention. And I see there are a number of questions coming in in the present in the in the in the Q and A box, which our distinguished chairman uh, Minji Lin will then also address to the audience. Thank you very much. Yes, we. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Cosper, for your uh, simple words that um, making all the difficult knowledge so easy to understand. You. Uh, talk about depression, not only from the ancient time to the modern, but also the emocrafly to the modern um, 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 electronic version of uh, machine learning. And uh, we have uh, plenty of uh, questions coming in in the Q&A box. Uh, most of them, I think, are very interesting. So um, I don't know whether we can start from um, I don't know whether we are able to cover all them all, but uh, I think we can start from um, some questions that really catch my eye. Uh, the first question is, can you um, uh, explain a little bit about um, um, the, how long will you diagnose a person with, um, um, okay, how long? Will you have to watch a patient to be diagnosed with depression? Mm -hmm. Well, this is, the, yeah, sorry. This is, this is a very important question. So I remember there was a colleague, Professor Tellenbach from Heidelberg, you know, he said, when the patient comes in the door and uh, until the patient sits down to my, fix my chair, I made already 90% of my diagnosis. So that was within seconds, right? <laughs> so I think as an experienced psychiatrist, which I also teach my students, if you see the patients, please watch carefully first how they are dressed, how they approach you and how they sit down and how they start talking. I think then you have already seen a lot what's going on if a patient is uh, very kind, tries, oh, doctor, I'm sure you saw a lot of patients already. Now I have to tell you all my problems also. You can be pretty sure that you're close to a depressed patient opposed to another patient who say, oh, doctor, how many patients do you see? Do you have enough time for me? You know, but this is ridiculous and you probably charge me also some money. Then you see already this is a different type of patient. So, of course, this... Uh, this, this uh, hypothesis has then been also to be substantiated by further questions. And what I always see in primary care that doctors, non-psychiatrists, they say, oh, mm -hmm. I do not want to touch the diagnosis because I have so many patients wait, waiting out there in the waiting room. And if I start asking these psychiatric questions, I, I, there is no end to this. But I think uh -huh. we should encourage them to ask very specific questions like how is your drive how is your interest when you come home and your children or your wife greets you does it go affectionate with you so ask this very specific question like you would ask also a patient with diabetes or a patient with heart problems you would also ask very specific questions there are some key questions which are also addressed in the uh, short the so-called mini diagnostic interview which should be which we also used these questions will lead you very soon to the diagnosis of depression and on the other hand i think in depression we are lucky nowadays if a patient comes and you have the thought well it might be depression and you're not 100 percent sure you could give him an antidepressant like for instance escitalopram and um, if the patient responds, then you, are, uh, you have the proof, it's right. You just should also check if the patient has additional anxiety disorders, because if the patient has depression and anxiety disorders, which is quite frequent, like 60%, then you, if you give an SSRI, anxiety will increase, unfortunately. And if you're a private doctor, this patient is not coming back to you again, because this is a bad doctor. I feel worse than at the beginning, right? So then this patient would, would be in need to have some additional like benzodiazepines like alprazolam or start with a very low dosage. 
Mm -hmm. So the answer um, to this question for Professor Cosper might uh, 10 seconds for, because you can judge, you can diagnose the patients from the very first second and from the appearance. But for most of us, we need to watch very clearly, carefully of all the symptoms that we can um, also uh, use the mini questions to um, speed up the um, diagnosis. And let's move on to the next question. This question is a little bit exciting. Uh, be prepared, Professor Cosper. Do you reject the biopsychosocial model of depression? Since oh. we have talked a lot about um, biological aspects of depression. Oh, this is a very important question. So by no means I reject the biosocial <laughs> thing, but I think we are nowadays too much social, right? And even if we think social, we should not forget this social affects our brain. And we should be always aware, what right. does this uh, social environment do to the brain? Because you probably will agree, it's not very easy to change the psychosocial environment, right? Like in marriage, for instance, the working place, usually they don't want to change these kind of situations. But I think as doctors, we should always be thinking, what does this do to the brain? But if you realize this environment is toxic, then at some stage, we should say also to our patients, well, now I've brought you out of depression, but if you are not able to change your environment, this depression doesn't get better, right? So we... I, sometimes I say also to my patients, I can give you the best medication, but uh, if you do not change this environment, this working place, but then the patient says, no, I have only three more years for retirement. I, if I change right now, then I lose a lot of money, right? You know, all these situations, then we have to guide this patient through the last three years to answer this question, by no means I reject the biosocial environment, but uh, I think right now, that was one of my first slides, we are too much engaged into the nurture and we should look more about the nature, what it does to the organ, to the brain health, to these patients. Mm -hmm. So that's very important because otherwise we could be social workers, right? Just social workers and talk with them, right? So it's no problem, no problem. But we are medical doctors. We have the advantage that we can look also into the brain and we have these beautiful mechanisms, which I showed you today. And they help us to better understand how the brain works with this social environment. Yes, so uh, um, in short, the social factors will influence brain eventually. So we have to look up into the brain activities that may be um, affected by uh, psycho psychological social factors. So the next question uh, will be moving on to, um, do you think, um, should we um, treat agitated or mixed depression with SSRIs? Oh. Agitated and mixed depression, I think, is a right. very important issue because agitation and mixed depression, they seem to go uh, along with each other. And it's most important that we tell the patient, frankly, agitation needs to go down, right? So, and we should definitely treat them differently. I would, uh, based on the previous history, for instance, if there is addictive properties, of course, I will not give you give this patient benzodiazepines, but I, I would be inclined to start with this medication of clonazepam when there's too much um, agitation or, or like also mixed anxiety. And when it's mixed anxiety, depression, then I would think also about bipolar disorder quite early already because mixed anxiety depression is quite often linked to bipolar disorder to my understanding. Mm -hmm. And I would, for instance, start also with a low dose of atypical antipsychotic. But a mixed anxiety and agitated depression, I think the, the agitation and the mixed problem make them more problems than the depression itself. So mixed and uh, uh, and agitated depression symptom needs to go first in treatment. All right. 
Thank you, Professor Cosper. Uh, I think we suppose we can allow two or three more questions. Um, the next question is, what is your opinion in nutrients such as the vitamins as therapeutic applications? Um, the similar question goes to uh, other treatment models like TTCS or, uh, or deep brain stimulation. What you, are your thoughts about these um, strategies? Oh, there are quite different, uh, far distant approaches, right? Vitamins, usually, well, in, in, win in winter time right now, vitamin D is down in Austria, right? So, so we, need to, <laughs> we need to tell the patients, either you spend more days outdoor, right? Or you mm -hmm. take some vitamin D supplementation. Vitamin D has to be increased by no question. But if I look at the patients and they tell me all these different vitamins, I tell them, well, this helps very much the pharmacist, right? But probably not like you, because you do not look like an Indian sadhu, you know, because if you're very skinny, <laughs> you know, but I'm just eating uh, strange corns, you know, usually the, 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 the food which we eat has enough vitamins. Of course, I would check also the vitamin B12 and the folic acid, in when I do the blood examination, but in nearly all of my patients, this is no problem. But I would say in at least half of my patients, vitamin D is low in winter time, so I would supplement this. Then deep brain stimulation, I think that's for the treatment resistant depression and treatment resistant depression is uh, quite a, a big problem also with regard to suicidality and First, I would do, of course, some other treatments like uh, uh, for me, the algorithm would be first to start with like esketamine and probably then ECT. And if all of these doesn't work, then we would call it refractory depression. Then I would start also deep brain stimulation. But unfortunately, there are just a few centers in Europe who do this. In Vienna, we don't do it. We do vagus nerve stimulation and um, then this patient can be referred to one of these centers. Wow. So speaking of the ketamine, um, one audience uh, worry is a worry about the, um, um, is there any possible that recreational use of this kind of um, antidepressant like as ketamine will cause depression of abuse potential? Well, this has of course been very carefully studied and in the whole uh, treatment program, there was no indication that it has some addictive properties. And you can easily derive it that in the long term, where there are some long term studies where I also participated with my department, the dosage was decreased, as a matter of fact. And in addictive oh. properties, you would increase the dosage, right? So, so it was yeah. decreased. But of course, this is a different kind of approach. Like if you give a patient a whole package of esketamine nasal spray and say, whenever you feel down, please take a nasal spray, then soon you will have an addictive patient, right? So the patient needs to mm -hmm. come into the brain health center, let's call it like this, a brain health center gets this nasal spray and goes away. So it will be never a give out medication. But on the other hand, Fine. like... Um, Fine. This uh, ketamine yeah. is also available as a party drug. Yeah. It can be very easily bought in some, some kind of things, but I would not advise it. So if you give it as a medical appliance, then this does not have any problems. But still, we need to, um, we need to uh, wait for longitudinal studies to yeah. uh, verify the, this potential of depressant or abuse potential. I, I, you know, there is also one thing that you shouldn't give it in patients with addiction. But I have to tell you, I have a, one patient who is addicted to, I think, a lot of things, you know, even cocaine and everything, and he was depressed. Then we did this esketamine, uh, in this case as an infusion. And he told me very frankly, well, this is another treatment than what I do with my cocaine and this kind of thing. And he felt much better. So the story short, when it's given in a medical setting, in a medical setting with rules, milligrams and everything, then it's good. But right now for the whole situation, stay away from patients with addictive properties with this medication.
Mm -hmm. So as long as we provide the escatome in the very safe um, medical setting, I think yeah. um, these side effects will be reduced uh, greatly. And the last question, I think it's about time, but uh, so many questions, I need to choose one. Um, how do you prevent withdrawal symptoms that may be uh, secondary to the antidepressant? Oh, the withdrawal symptoms are very important. And I think we mainly see it with tricyclic antidepressants. Then we see it with venlafaxine and we see it with paroxetine. So when you have tricyclic, which is not very much used anymore, but we still have it with venlafaxine and with paroxetine, we have to tell the patient, well, now we, you're in a transition period and you might have some symptoms which remind you on depression because the withdrawal symptoms are pretty much like the depressive symptoms, but on the other hand, also difference like with the uh, pain in the body, like with the wipe in the body and so on. So the patient needs to be aware and we tell them it takes one week to 10 days, maximum two weeks in this transition mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. And we go gradual down when the patient is on 225 mm -hmm. of Velofaxi and you go to 150 one week and the next week you go to 75 and you cross taper the other medication in and you very frankly tell the patient this is a difficult period and then the patient will be also in, uh, safe. Mm. So as long as we keep her the antidepressants um, in a very slow uh, way, so all the withdrawal symptoms could be prevented. Yeah, that's all about the questions. And uh, I um, actually, I have my own question for you, uh, but um, can you give us a one word for the young people in the world, like in, for the young psychiatrists in the world, what, how, how, um, how can we be successful as you for not only the clinical service, but also the academic uh, research field? Oh, thank you for this very personal question. <laughs> I have to say, I, in, I envy the young population quite a lot because, of course, they are younger, more beautiful and everything, of course, this. But I think nowadays they have much more possibilities. They have all these possibilities, oh. which, for instance, I as a young psychiatrist did not have, right? So they, they mm -hmm. have all this computer equipment and they have all the different tools. So I think the young colleagues they should think about neuroscience, how this whole system works on the brain and look at the different brain mechanisms. And I think also universities are well advised to give more neuroscience input into their training because we realized this also in Vienna that we learned them too much about also psychosocial connections and usually young people are not so interested in psychosocial connections because they still look around to find a partner to get sort of separated from their families. So they do not have this insight as yet how to deal with the pathological things. I, I think we should bring them in with brain health and when they are more settled, then they can think also about the psychosocial surroundings more carefully. But I think the young population they should think about neuroscience. They should go to neuroscience meetings, for instance, or even better go to CIMP meetings. What do you think, Minji? <laughs> that is the excellent thing to learn. I fully agree. I fully, and, I cannot agree more. And the young colleagues, they, I think we should work on the mentor system, you know, that a mentor system that the older psychiatrist explain them what the symptoms might be because um, I think um, the, the patient didn't change that much. Just our understanding of the patient symptomatology changed a bit. Wow, thank you. Thank you for so much um, um, valuable suggestion. So let me uh, make two summaries of today's uh, talk. Um, I think two messages that can be considered as um, the take-home message the first one is depression is toxic. Um, the second one is neuroscience, the core of our career. So let's thank um, Professor Cosper again. And I think you cannot hear all the applause um, from the audiences, which, is, which comes up from our mind, but we really appreciate 
the knowledge that you delivered to us. Thank you. We hope to see you soon and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Siegfried, bye -bye. for being with us. It was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you. Thank you. So let's move on to uh, Professor Sumernova for the next uh, speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Ming Chu, for amazing supervision of the first part of the webinar. First of all, we would like to express our gratitude to everyone once again for joining us at this uh, webinar, Meet the Expert number one. And we would like to say that we have 635 registered participants for this webinar, and it's really an impressive number. This webinar is organized by Professor Konstantinos Funtulakis by Master of Sciences Program on Clinical Mental Health, Aristotle University of Saloniki. It's also co-organized by the Taipei University and my pleasure to co-organize on behalf of Samara State Medical University and our international te team. It's a great pleasure for all of us and for me in person, it's an honor and I would say it's a lifetime opportunity to announce our next legendary speaker, Professor Sir Robin Murray. Everyone knows brilliant papers of Professor Murray on schizophrenia as neurodevelopmental disorder, uh, genetics of schizophrenia, dopamine, drug-induced psychosis. Professor Robin Murray is in the top three of schizophrenia research in the world. Professor Robin Murray is Professor of Psychiatric Research at the Institute of Psychiatry, Psychology and Neuroscience in King's College, London. Professor also cares for people with psychosis in the NHS system and has written over, you can imagine, 800 articles and is the most frequently cited psychosis researcher outside of the United States. Uh, Professor Robin Murray has supervised 72 PhDs, 12 MD theses, and 40 of his students have become full professors. So it means for us incredible leadership and absolute mentorship talent of Professor Robin Murray, I dare to say from my level. <laughs> and uh, Professor Robin Murray is knighted by the British monarchy for his great contribution to the medicine. So let's welcome Professor Sir Robin Murray to our international stage. It's our great honor. Thank you, Professor Murray. Thank, thank you, Dario, for that, that, that very nice uh, introduction. Can, can you see my slides? Yes, we see your slides. Perfect. Thank Full you. Full screen. So like Siegfried, I'm going to give my talk in two parts so that you have a little bit of a rest in the middle and, and, and I have a rest in the middle. So you can see I've received payments for lectures from various pharmaceutical company, companies. And I thought I would start off with a, 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 a really a, a slide for, for ladies. Uh, but also some more fashionable men will know that DNG stands for Dolce and Gabbana. But uh, the Professor Robin Hemsley made this joke, which I'm borrowing from him, that it should also, in relation to psychosis, it should stand for dopamine and genes, because these are very important uh, factors in the genesis of uh, psychosis. And uh, you, you, if we start with dopamine, there have been numerous PET scan studies. And uh, this one is done by Samir Johar uh, and Oliver House in our department. And the, you know that you can inject radio labeled uh, a, a dopa a, a, into individuals and it's taken up in this striatum. And when you compare people with schizophrenia, with control subjects, you find that the people with, at least with acute schizophrenia, while people are, are acutely psychotic, they show an excess of dopamine. So this has been called the, 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 the final common pathway to psychosis. But 
as you can see now, it's not only schizophrenia that's associated with an increase in uh, striatal dopamine, in, in the synthesis and release of striatal dopamine, but it's also bipolar mania. So when people are manic, they show the same excess. This is a wonderful study. This is a heroic study because this took Dr. Johar five years to collect people with mania who would nevertheless sit in the PET scan for 35 minutes. And of course, as well as getting the patients, he had to persuade the, the, the people who ran the PET scanner to let manics go into the PET scanner because they were worried that uh, it would be destroyed by, by the manic patient. But so this is the only study that has done this, but it's very interesting in that it shows that the same underlying a biological mechanism underlying acute schizophrenia and acute mania. So we have to think, what does this mean for Kreplin's dichotomy, that schizophrenia or dementia praecox and manic depression or schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are separate disorders. And yet they have the same uh, dysfunction of dopamine. And of course, that explains why people with acute psychosis respond to D2 blockade and why people with mania respond to D2 blockade, because it's the same neurochemical uh, 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 aberration, which is, which is driving both conditions. So there we go with dopamine. What about genes? This of course, I think is the most famous uh, slide in biological psychiatry. I imagine very many of you will have seen this. And this is, uh, this is a, a version, uh, an upgraded version of a paper first published in Nature in, 2020, in 2014. And this is, as you can see, is what they call a Manhattan plot because it looks somewhere like the skyscrapers of Manhattan, like the skyline of Manhattan. Along the bottom are the different uh, chromosomes from one to 22. And up the side is the significance of differences between patients and controls. Not the usual number of patients that we study in uh, psychiatry, 40 patients or 400 patients, but 65,000 patients and 87,000 controls. Huge study. And each of these little skyscrapers is a, an area of the genome where a marker has differential frequency in the patients versus the controls. So there are actually 256 single nucleotide polymorphisms, markers, where the patients differ from the, from the control subjects. So these inherit, you do not inherit schizophrenia. You do not inherit psychosis. You inherit little genes which make you more vulnerable. So in some ways, this, if you think of another, if you think of a, a, other, a, other conditions, well, actually height is a very, it has a similar uh, genetics. So there are, hundreds of genes which determine your height, but they don't totally determine your height because your nutrition and uh, your, whether you're healthy as a child and other, lots of other factors uh, affect your height. And similarly, there are all these little genes which can, can together affect your vulnerability to psychosis, but they don't make you, you do not inherit definitely the, the development of, psycho, of psychosis. And what we can do is we can add up all of these little uh, uh, areas and you can see in each patient how many different variants do they have. Do they have a huge number of uh, variants which, which are different than the control subjects or is it, is it a modest number? So we can do this and we develop the polygenic risk score, which really is a, the first time we've had a measure of genetic loading for psychosis. But I, I, I regard schizophrenia 
as just severe psychosis. I don't think there's anything magic about a discrete disease. I think it's just like I, I, you might think that there's a, there is a, you might think that there is a, a dimension of a blood pressure. So psychosis is not like uh, is not like having a broken leg. If you have a broken leg, there's a small proportion of the population have a broken leg and I, the rest of the population have a healthy leg or a small proportion of the population have a uh, measles or COVID, for example, and the rest of the population, I don't. So you either have it or you are, or, 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 well, maybe COVID is not such a exa good example because you can have it without the symptoms. And we used to think schizophrenia was like this. We used to think schizophrenia was a discrete disease. And we used to think that people who had schizophrenia had uh, bizarre ideas. They couldn't communicate properly with other people. They could not plan for the future. They were very strange in many ways. And then we thought they were normal people. And we thought, well, these are people are quite different, difficult, different. And of course, I'm not suggesting that Trump is psychotic. Trump is very strange, but I'm showing it. I'm just uh, showing Trump as an example of how broad our concept of normal is. So nowadays we know that many people with schizophrenia who get a diagnosis of schizophrenia are quite sensible about most things except their delusions. And many people who we regard as normal are not at all sensible. I'm going to have to stop showing this joke actually as uh, hopefully Trump recedes into the background. So now we know there are hundreds of susceptibility genes. This is not compatible with a discrete illness where you, you either do or don't have the gene. It's a question of how many of these little vulnerability genes do you have? So we can think that there's a normal distribution and over on the left hand side, there are people who have very little susceptibility to psychosis. Most of us are in the middle. And then as you go towards the, the right hand side, you're more likely to run into problems. So if you pass this first yellow threshold, then you might be more likely to have one or two minor psychotic symptoms. You might be a bit paranoid about your neighbor. You might think then that you might falsely think that the neighbor is banging on your uh, on, on the ceiling of your flat at four o'clock in the morning to deliberately wake you up and put you off your sleep. Or you might uh, think that other people are trying to influence your thinking, but you get you, you, you don't uh, ever come to the attention of psychiatrists. But then there are people who look as if they might go psychotic and they get referred to an at-risk or a prodromal clinic. And when you measure their polygenic risk score, it's a bit higher. Then you measure people, then you look at people who get a diagnosis of psychosis, but not, they're not severe enough to get a diagnosis of schizophrenia, maybe diagnosed as paranoid psychosis or brief reactive psychosis. So their polygenic score on average is a bit higher again. And up at the top, we have people who have a, a, a polygenic risk score uh, a, 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 for, for schizophrenia. So this is this has been a helpful development. It, it's not it doesn't give statistical power. You can't go out into the general population and take the uh, the people with the highest one percent and say that they'll all develop schizophrenia. But they're certainly much more likely that they will develop a, a psychosis and schizophrenia. Now the other interesting thing that we've learned from the, the, the molecular genetics is that the genes are not specific for one condition. The genes overlap between different conditions. And uh, here we can see, see what the heritabilities are, uh, 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 molecular heritabilities, because um, so far the molecular genetics only explains a, a proportion of heritability. But uh, here you can see that uh, ADHD and bipolar seem to have the highest, schizophrenia next, then depression and, and autism. But here are the situations where uh, there is sharing of, of the genes. And you can see that there's quite a lot of sharing between people with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. There's again, quite a lot of sharing between people with bipolar disorder and a uh, dep major depression. And there's a bit, but less so uh, between schizophrenia 
and major depression. So we're, we're learning that, that as it's in psychiatry, there are no sharp boundaries for everything, for anything, everything, everything I, I has fuzzy edges and merges into the, the next condition. And this is a very nice study from Cardiff where they applied the polygenic risk score for schizophrenia to different conditions. And you can see that here, here are uh, people with schizophrenia, and this is the relative risk score uh, for the polygenic risk score. You can see it's the highest. Then you can see that here are people with schizoaffective bipolar disorder, and they have the next highest people with bipolar one, and then bipolar two. There's a sort of, there's a, a dimension. And over here, you can see people with bipolar disorder. These ones have had no, no psychotic symptoms ever in their lifetime. And these ones have had a psychotic symptoms in, 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 their, in, in their lifetime. I, and this is the same with mood incongruence. The, here we have people who are on the left. Oops, I've lost my pointer. I, Daria, can you see the pointer or not? Well, the point, we, the... we, we do. Yes, no, now we see. Yes, now we, we see. see. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so, so uh, uh, whoops. Over, over on the right, you can see, oops, pointer's gone. You can see people who have a uh, low mood incongruence, and here are people with high mood incongruence. So, the, essentially, the more you look like somebody with schizophrenia, then the higher higher your your uh, polygenic risk score for schizophrenia is. So the re you know psychiatrists are often very upset about different you know people getting different diagnoses and patients or patients' relatives say, well, once once my daughter went to see a psychiatrist and they were diagnosed as having schizophrenia, then the next time they went and they were diagnosed as having schizoaffective disorder, then now they've been told that they have bipolar disorder. This is a pretty hopeless state of affairs. I mean, why can't you psychiatrists make up your mind? And the, the, the reason is these disorders, they share genetic predisposition and they share propensity to synthesize excess dopamine. So the one merges into the other. And sometimes a patient may present looking as if they have bipolar with psychotic symptoms. And other times they may present looking as, they have, as if they have schizophrenia. I always tell the story of uh, seeing a patient with one of my junior colleagues. And this patient had been in hospital eight times. And I think three times they'd got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And a uh, I think maybe three times they'd got a diagnosis of bipolar and twice schizoaffective disorder. And I was very sure that this patient had bipolar disorder. So I said to the young psychiatrist, who on earth were these psychiatrists that diagnosed schizophrenia? This is clear that this patient has got bipolar disorder with psychotic symptoms. And the, I could see that the, my colleague, young colleague's mouth begin to twitch. And then he began to, to, to grin and, and said, well, Professor Murray, you were one of these silly, or, or he didn't say silly, you were one of these psychiatrists who diagnosed this lady as having schizophrenia in the past. Uh, so it's just sometimes impossible to tell. So there's, there is genetic and neurochemical overlap. But schizophrenic and bipolar patients do differ in some ways, particularly in their development. And this is a study from Dunedin, uh, in so south of New Zealand, the development of about, about a thousand children was assessed 10 times from age three. At age 26, they were all interviewed. 96% of them were interviewed using it by a psychiatrist. And the development of those who developed schizophrenia, schizophreniform disorder, was examined. And those who met Creedy of you wonder why are we using the schizophreniform criteria? Really, because if you only have a thousand children, you're not going to have enough who will actually meet, eventually meet the criteria for schizophrenia. But so we broadened it out. And schizophreniform disorder is essentially DSM uh, schizophrenia, but only lasting for a month. And you might think you wouldn't get any evidence of uh, developmental factors in such a wishy-washy uh, group. 
but they had, had had more obstetric complications, higher neonatal insults, smaller for gestational age, and more hypoxia. So this is uh, is like is one of numerous studies which have shown that people with schizophrenia uh, are likely to have uh, had development. They're significantly more likely to have developmental insults. Only a minority of people with schizophrenia, but much more commonly than in people with bipolar disorder. Now, uh, here here is a. This is a study that that we've been doing. We've been following up in premature babies since 1979. And uh, in 1979, and of course, if, if you're premature now, if you're born before uh, 37 weeks in 2020 or 2021, it's not so terrible. But in 1971, it was quite terrible because the treatments were much worse. And we followed these babies up, 300 of these babies up into adult life. And uh, they have a, a range of different, they, they are more likely to have the different psychopathology and it's related to the, the insults to their brain. So here is a young man who uh, at birth we could see on his uh, ultrasound. This is one of the first uh, series to have cranial ultrasound. He had uh, in, enlarged ventricles as a baby and he still has enlarged ventricles age 18, you can see here. And he was all right as a as a as a as a child. He was a bit shy, and he wasn't a he wasn't as clever as his brothers and sisters. But when he became nineteen, he was nineteen. He was had been born at twenty seven weeks. His birth weight was very low, nine hundred and thirty nine grams, and you could see the bilateral ventricular hemorrhage. When he was nineteen, he started noticing coincidences. Music seemed to refer to him personally. He believed his college tutor was the devil and birds were talking about him and they could tell there was a force inside him and he thought that the Beatles had come to save the world through him. Amazing that the Beatles still had this influence uh, all these years after the night uh, uh, from the 1960s. And he was treated with uh, a, a relatively small dose of an antipsychotic and did quite well. But we've uh, done, in 2002 with Mary Cannon, we did a meta-analysis and showed that it wasn't a specific complication of pregnancy or, or birth. It, there were a range of factors during pregnancy, during abnormal growth and development at the time of delivery. And we repeated this uh, in a much more sophisticated way uh, last year and really replicated the same uh, findings and much bigger, many more studies now, and a large range of pre and perinatal factors, but they just have relatively small effect sizes. It's not like it's only babies that were hypoxic or only babies that had prenatal uh, uh, infection or only babies whose mothers had preeclampsia. A range of these factors increase the risk. And we also know from the genetics that a small proportion of people with schizophrenia have copy number variants. That is to say that uh, they, they have a, a deletion, they lose, they lose a chunk of a, a chromosome or they have a duplication of a part of a chromosome. So these are, these are not the usual little, tiny little single nucleotide variants. These are really a, a, quite a big loss or duplication. And we know that these copy number variants account for at least 10% of autism, and they're also found in learning disability, and they're also found in autism, in, in, in epilepsy, as well as autism. And the, we, we looked to see whether they would be found in excess in schizophrenia, and they, all, they, they are too. So these copy number variants, they, they, they knock out a chunk of the genome involving genes in, involved in neurodevelopment. So it's not surprising that they cause quite a severe uh, form of, of, of schizophrenia with early developmental problems through, through childhood, lots of negative symptoms, lots of cognitive uh, difficulties and a relatively poor outcome. And so Mike Owen and colleagues have said there's a continuum of neurodevelopmental impairment from these copy number of agents through learning disability from autism to schizophrenia. But it doesn't reach the bipolar disorder. So you have 
the more you are, the, the bigger your copy number variant, the more intellectual disability you have, the more repeats you have, right down through schizophrenia into schizoaffected. So, but bipolar disorder does not show much in the way of an excess of copy number variants. Now, you'd expect that if a proportion of children have either had obstetric events or they've had a copy number variant or some other problem of neurodevelopment, then they would not perform quite as well as, say, the rest of the population. And this is, say, again, in the Dunedin study, uh, Mary Cannon, a long time ago, the ch they, here are the normal children in this line, here are the children who, who their motor development the ones who develop schizophreniform disorder, poorer motor development, often a bit clumsy, poorer receptive language, and their IQ was on average 95 rather than 100 because it's dragged down by the developmental impairment. And what about the mania? Well, it was in some ways the opposite. They seem to have better motor development and a better language and their IQ was, it wasn't significantly greater. But so there's been subsequent studies. Some have shown that pre-manic children have better, have better cognition, but the majority have shown that they just have the same cognition as the general public. I, we have followed up people with first episode psychosis. I, for 10 years, we had 103 people with schizophrenia, 19 with mania, and 64 controls, and there was a very slow decline. So there is not precipitate cognitive decline. There is no severe progression of cognitive problems in schizophrenia. There's just the same as there is in mania. And personally, I, I believe this is not related to the illness. I think this is related to the treatment. We heard, we heard uh, Sigrid Casper talking about the cognitive a side effects, I think it was of olanzapine. Uh, or, or, so we know that uh, some of these patients, the cognition is slightly impaired by the antipsychotic. And certainly we know that, excuse me, we know that anticholinergics are very bad for cognition. So we should try not never to prescribe, well, unless it's unavoidable, never to prescribe uh, anticholinergics because they're very bad for uh, cognition. Then some of these patients, of course, uh, drink too much or they take too much drugs or uh, they have other reasons why their cognition might be impaired. So here is the course of cognition in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The people with schizophrenia start off with premorbid impairment which gets worse towards the onset and then they have a, a very little uh, decline thereafter and here are people with bipolar disorder who start off much better and then show much the same a small decline. Other factors that increase risk of psychosis, uh, drug use, amphetamines, uh, or nowadays most, more, much more uh, uh, methamphetamine and colleagues from Taiwan will be very familiar with uh, this as, a, 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 as I think, I'm not sure if it's still, but it certainly has been a very big problem in the past, methamphetamine uh, psychosis and also in uh, Australia, South Africa. I talked to a colleague in Vancouver who told me that one quarter of all the psychotic people in Vancouver uh, suffered from methamphetamine psychosis and the other quarter, another quarter suffered from cannabis related psychosis. We in, in, in I don't think it's such a problem in, 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 uh, in Pacific countries, but in Europe, uh, Australia and uh, North America, Cannabis is a very big cause of psychosis. This is a meta-analysis we did, and all of these studies show, uh, these are, each of these is a different study. For example, here, this is Tien and colleagues in 1990 in the United States. And here are the people who took the 20% least cannabis. Here are the 20% who took the, the most cannabis. And you can see in every one of these studies, the people who took the most cannabis were more likely to be psychotic. But here you can see the risk is much higher here than it is here. And the reason for that, that is a study in London in 2012. So by 2012, cannabis was a lot stronger. 
and uh, people were getting a lot more THC uh, uh, here than they were here. So this has been one of the big problems in relation to cannabis all across the world has become very much stronger than it was way back in the 1960s and 70s. Final type of, uh, 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 of etiological factor, a uh, social factors. This is a, a first onset study we did in, in the UK and we found it's not surprising, child abuse, physical or sexual or child neglect or separation from patients, all of these traumas increased the risk of nearly all psychiatric disorders, including psychosis. And sadly, we neglected this uh, for, 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 for a long time. So I guess 30 years ago, we tended to think that schizophrenia was a genetic brain disease, but it is, it's not that simple. That genes are important and disturbed brain function is important, but so is the environment. If you think asthma is a lung disease, but what makes asthma worse? It may, it's living next to a motorway where you get, if, you get, if the, you're breathing all the pollution into the lungs, then your asthma uh, either develops or gets worse. And the brain is, is not uh, dealing with the air as, as like the lungs, but it's dealing with the social environment. And there can be toxic things in the social environment that uh, make psychosis worse or are precipitated. An interesting factor is that migration or belonging to an ethnic minority increases the risk. And this may be because people become alienated or uh, become uh, discriminated against, or perhaps during the migration, they've had such terrible trouble. If you think of people migrating from Syria, that they may migrate because their family, uh, members of the family have been killed in bombing, then they have to, get to to the, the to the, to the the coast of the the, the, the Mediterranean or uh, they have to get uh, across somehow uh, across the sea to, to to Greece and pay pe people smugglers they may nearly drown or their their little rubber boat may 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 uh, may sink and then they have to get uh, from Greece to where are they going Germany or to the UK so all of this is very tra traumatic and then they get to the host country and they discover the host country that people may not be very pleased to see them and they may be discriminated against. So all of these uh, adversities increase the risk of psychosis. Bullying, we now, we used to ignore this, but I still see patients in their 30s and 40s who, when you ask them, what, what voices do you hear? I hear the voices of the boys who bullied me at school. An interesting fact of being brought up in the inner city. Uh, schizophrenia is an inner city disease and adverse life events, but particularly victimization. If a, a, again, Siegfried was talking about some of the social factors associated with depression, but there are many losses. You lose your job, your, your spouse leaves you, your girlfriend dumps you. In psychosis, it's more uh, as I said, bu bullying or being beat beaten up in the street, being chased by gangs, having your house uh, burgled, these kind of life events. But if dopamine is the final common pathway, can social factors uh, cause this? Well, this is a very nice study by Dr. Mizrahi in, in Canada. And she took normal controls, people, with the at-risk mental state and people with schizophrenia and stress them by giving the Montreal stress test. And this is quite a nasty psychological, it's a very stressful psychological test. So she would take maybe, uh, she would take a dozen people and say, we're going to give you this, ar these arithmetic and while you're in the scanner and it will be quite difficult. Uh, and what they do is they give, make it just too difficult for the person to do. Uh, so the person gets very stressed because they're, they're making mistakes. And then sometimes when the person has got it right, they say wrong. So you say, the question is, what is three times seven? And you say uh, 21 and they say wrong. And then they, you're on to the next one and you think, was that really wrong? But you don't have time to go back. 
So you get more flustered. Then a voice says, you're doing very badly. You were, you're the worst in the whole group. And remember, we're going to put the results up on the board so that everybody will see it. Are you not trying? So you get very stressed by this. And so in normal controls, I'm not sure if you can see it, but there is, you can see a little bit of a blue color there. But in the people with the prodrome in the at-risk mental state, they produce much more dopamine when they're stressed. And here are the people with schizophrenia. When they are stressed and trying to do these this cognitive tasks, the, they get much more stress and produ produce much more dopamine. And this reminds us that people with schizophrenia are exclusively, are exquisitely, exquisitely reactive to stress. So, and of course, this is important in the way we care for people with schizophrenia. All too often in many countries, if pe people with schizophrenia live in the worst conditions in some terrible hospital or in the worst part of town, they don't have enough money. And uh, so they, they're living in conditions which would be difficult for all of us, the, for the most stable of us. But yet uh, they are much more likely to break down than we are in the social, in social stress. So the final common pathway to psychosis, either schizophrenia or, or bipolar disorder, is dopamine dysregulation and social factors like stress, childhood abuse, migration, drug abuse, all of these have been shown to impact on striatal dopamine. So I'm going to stop uh, at this point and uh, I'll be very happy to have uh, uh, questions, but essentially I think there have been three different models of psychosis there was the dopaminergic one, which stretches back to, to the 1960s. And then there was the neurodevelopmental one, which stretches back to the 1980s. And then there's the cognitive one. So the, the cognitive psychologists began uh, producing uh, uh, models of, uh, of, of psychosis, uh, and very interesting models in, in, in the early 2000s. And of course, the Dopaminergic model doesn't really usually talk about development or cognition at all. And certainly the cognitive model, the first, the most important paper in the cognitive model is by Phil, Philip, uh, uh, Philip Agarity in 2010. It doesn't mention the brain, let alone mention dopamine. So we have to integrate all of these models uh, together and take the correct components from each of these. When I was a young psychiatrist, we looked for a big genetic cause. We thought there might be one gene, or we looked for a big uh, environmental cause. But we know that psychosis is like a, many other disorders, and it is multifactorial. Think of coronary artery disease. And coronary artery disease, why does somebody have a heart attack? Well, it may be because they are obese, and they smoke too many cigarettes and they don't take enough exercise. Uh, but it also may be because they inherit uh, high lipids or they inherit a vulnerability to hypertension uh, or they develop diabetes. So all of these factors come together to cause the, 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 uh, to, 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 to cause the clot on the, on the coronary artery. So there, there are multifactorial causes. And similarly, it is with psychosis that there are uh, genetic factors, there's early physical causes, there's social adversity, and there's, there's drug abuse. Uh, and all of these factors focus down eventually on the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the dopamine system in the vast majority of cases. And the frequency of Psychosis depends on the prevalence of risk factors. And this is something we'll come, the, the, the incidence of psychosis and schizophrenia is not the same worldwide, it varies hugely. And that depends on the exposure to different risk factors. And I will stop at the, that point and I'm very happy to uh, answer uh, questions if people are not too exhausted. Thank you very much, Professor Robin Murray, amazing lecture we're all enjoying uh, i'm sure 
every one of us and uh, thinking about the genes and environment and we have a, a list of questions uh, and uh, you should understand that uh, uh, different range of questions from professors and from other career psychiatrists so uh, they have go they go they go from different level uh, so well, one question is from Anka Livia Panfil, which, uh, who is an early career psychiatrist from Romania. She asks, what is your opinion about using um, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing technique in psychosis just because traumatic events you were talking about? No mention. Well, isn't that terrible? The first question, and I can't, I can't answer it. <laughs> oh, who was this terrible person who asked this question? No, it's a smart question, but I don't know the answer to it. I, I know that uh, that it, it is used in, uh, in 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 PTSD or trauma, and I think it, it, you you correctly point out that the same factors that may cause a, in some people a PTSD in other people may contribute to the onset of, of psychosis. And I, and it's an interesting question, why does the same trauma cause a, a person a, to develop a PTSD and another person to develop psychosis? And I presume it's the effect of other risk factors, environmental or the effect of genes. And I, th I think what we're now realizing, and this is the, the point of your question, I think that we usually treat all psychosis or all schizophrenia as the same. We say you're going to have an antipsychotic and you're going to have CBT. But I'm sure that the treatment for people who've been traumatized is going to be very different from people who have been abusing a methamphetamine. I had a very interesting experience with one of my close colleagues who was a, a, a lady who was a lecturer in my department and she was a very sensible and robust uh, person, but uh, not, sort of, not neurotic at all and not prone, uh, I would have thought, to psychosis. And one day she was walking home and it was getting dark and she saw a three young men who had managed to capture a fox and they had tied newspaper to the tail of this pop fox and lit, and, and lit it with a match. So this poor fox was running around in agony with its tail burning. And she went across uh, and they shouted, uh, uh, shouted, well, very courageously shouted at these uh, young men. And they, they left the fox and they beat her up and she had to be taken to hospital. And she was uh, she was only in hospital, I think, for a night. A night. But for the next, for, for the, the, then she began hearing voices. She could hear the voices, not not just the voices of what the boys were, the, the young men had been saying, but she heard the voices commenting on her and talking about her. And this persisted for about three weeks. And of course, she was very worried. She was developing psychosis. And after three weeks, it disappeared. And it's as far as I know, never come back. So presumably, we all have some vulnerability. And she was lucky that she has, uh, she is, has a robust, uh, she obviously has the capacity to develop a psychotic, uh, to, to hear voices, but also the resilience to that they, 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 they disappeared. So presumably, uh, uh, we, 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 people who have developed psychosis following s some similar trauma to that, then we have to specifically uh, develop treatments addressed not just at the, the voices but at, uh, at, at the original trauma. But anyway, this is uh, the, so far one question and I've taken a very long time to say I don't know the answer. Thank you very much Professor Robin Murray. Thank you for this interesting case. By the way, I was working under the supervision of Professor Asun Jablenski in Australia and his Center of Clinical Research in Neuropsychiatry. And I was also heated by the amphetamine user on the 2nd January in the center of the city. However, I haven't, uh, you know, developed voices, uh, but it was uh, quite, <laughs> quite anxious uh, uh, situation. Uh, if you... Um, 
Uh, don't mind another question from Professor Paul Cumming. Uh, he asked, he's asking, there is the meta-analysis on F-DOPA PET studies uh, indicated an effect size of uh, 0.8 for elevated dopamine synthesis in patients with schizophrenia. This means that 50% of patients fail within the normal range. If dopamine is not a miss, what is? Professor Cummins is asking. Gosh, that, this, is a, this, is a, this is a really difficult question. I hope you've got some nice, easy ones uh, later. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so I think, no, it's a very good question. And there's, of course, been a lot of discussion about this. And of course, the other thing we do know is the people with the highest dopamine uh, synthesis and release uh, who respond best to antipsychotics. We don't do anything about the, the synthesis, but we block the effects of the dopamine. So the question is, what about these people uh, who, 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 who don't show this, uh, this excess of dopamine? Is it that, uh, that they have had it at some point and, they, and, and this, is, uh, this is resolved and it has left them with the, with, with, with the psychotic symptoms? Or is it they, they have never uh, that they have never shown uh, an abnormality of dopamine? So we've been interested in this, and, and I, I had a very clever PhD psychiatrist called Arsimi Demjaha, and she was a, worked uh, with myself and Oliver House to look at the uh, striatal dopamine with the, the usual F-dopa system. Uh, in people with treatment-resistant schizophrenia. And these people with treatment-resistant schizophrenia, they did not show an excess of uh, the striatal dopamine. And this makes quite good sense because if they have, uh, if they have an if they don't show an, any abnormality of dopamine, why would they respond to uh, standard dopamine blockers? And there's been some evidence that these people are more likely to have a glutamatergic abnormality and a lady called Alice Egerton has shown that also in uh, in first onset psychosis that uh, people with a glutamatergic abnormality may be, may, may be less responsive to to d2 blockers so I think as Dr. Casper said there's increasing interest for depression there's increasing interest in the glutamate system and then NMDA in relation to 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 psychosis to psychosis as well, so I I I don't know the 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 answer to 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 the, to that question. There's been a lot of interest in glutamate and glutamatergic drugs, but Professor Cummings and others will know that so far it, they have not been fruitful in terms of a, uh, of a therapeutic advances and that uh, drug companies have spent a fortune on developing a glutamatergic drugs in psychosis, but so far they have not uh, uh, pro pro proved sufficiently useful to be brought into the, into the clinic. So there's an, an area for, uh, for greater study. And excuse me, one, one final point. We've talked about a, a, the effect size and the proportion of patients having an abnormality of synthesis and the release of dopamine. We haven't said anything about the dopamine receptor. And I think we know that, that presynaptic factors are most important, but it is possible that in some patients, they may have normal presynaptic dopamine, but they may have supersensitivity of the D2 receptor. And I think this is particularly the case for drug abusers. And we, we, you'll know that if people abuse alcohol or they abuse opium or they abuse cannabis, then they actually decrease the uh, presynaptic dopamine released. So if you, if you study psychotic people who've been using cannabis, their uh, dopamine levels are actually low. But if you then uh, stress them or give them uh, amphetamine, even a very small amount, just to increase their dopamine levels into the normal range, they, their psychosis gets worse. So uh, Dr. Uh, 
Anissa Abidargam in 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 uh, in New York has suggested that such people may have a supersensitive dopamine receptor. So it could be that it's the receptor in a proportion of patients and not the the the, the presynaptic uh, aspect, which is abnormal. Okay, a nice easy question, please. <laughs> Dear Professor Robin Murray, you always say that it, you don't know how to answer the question, but we are so impressed with your answers. Th thank you so much. There is a, um, we would like to know your opinion about, um, you uh, uh, told us about the uh, motor and uh, language impairment uh, in uh, uh, schizophrenia, and we would like to know the role of uh, thought language and communication disorders, the part of cognitive and different type of schizophrenia. What is your, um, what is your opinion on this uh, issue? And we also in Russia, we are uh, fans of uh, Team Crow uh, paper on, uh, you know, language uh, uh, was um, the reason uh, of the humanity uh, for getting psychosis in the, yeah. in the evolution. Thank you. So let, let's start with the Tim Crow. And I think uh, some of your younger listeners uh, may not fully be fully aware how important Tim Crow was, but Tim Crow ran the best schizophrenia unit in the world in the 1970s and uh, 80s. And uh, was very important in the dopamine theory and also in positive and negative symptoms. And Tim had the theory that, uh, that schizophrenia was the side effect of a gene for developing language uh, in humans. And uh, a very interesting uh, theory. And I suggested that there was a, 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 a it was a sex linked uh, a gene and that uh, that this this the development of the mutation that caused this gene helped people to be or humans to be to be able to develop the capacity for language and then if there was some abnormality in this gene then they might develop schizophrenia well of course that was in the days when we thought there might just be one gene involved now we know that there are lots of genes involved so it's not as simple as that but we do know that language is involved in, 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 in schizophrenia. And actually just in the last month, there's, there's been some developments on uh, the genetics of language. And uh, language, of course, uh, is, is again a uh, polygenic and it's not, uh, a, a, it's not simply, a cons or usually any disorders of a language are not simply a, 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 a result of one single mutation. But they have shown actually that there are some sex-linked genes in, in, involved. So some of certainly some of what I've meant to, to ask Tim Crow about the, uh, if he's read this paper. So I think uh, whereas I don't buy the the very attractive theory that, of Tim that it was a crucial step in humanity that uh, by accident causes schizophrenia, but uh, languages and genetics of language I think is involved, and we do know that people who develop schizophrenia are more likely to uh, have mixed handedness, people with autism also. And I showed it in the slide that, that, that the children who develop schizophrenia are more likely to have some language uh, difficulties. What are, what are voices? Voices are a misperception of inner language. So with inner speech, we produce the words from Broca's area, but normally we tell the auditory cortex somehow these are internal words. These are not coming from outside, but in schizophrenia or in psychosis, somehow that signal is lost. So we produce the internal words, but we process them as if they're coming from outside. So it seems, uh, and that co that's why people think that the voices are so real. So I think it, it, clearly language is, is involved, but it's it really, now that we know that there are a number of factors contributing to schizophrenia, the endophenotype abnormalities are not big. So when, I, when we used to think there was just one gene, we would talk about obligate carriers and we'd think that people 
a mother who had a schizophrenic father and a schizophrenic child that she would have one big gene which was mutated and so she would show all sorts of abnormalities but now we know that there's different a range of different factors that she might have some modest abnormality of EEG or some modest neuropsychological abnormality or modest uh, abnormality of a uh, hippocampal volume but they're not usually huge abnormalities. If we go on to talking about uh, treatment and also prevention, because I think we need to consider prevention. So I've alluded to neurodevelopment and in 1987, we suggested Sean Lewis and I that schizophrenia might in part be a neurodevelopmental disorder. And uh, Danny Weinberger, uh, in the United States came to the same conclusion. And for about 10 years, we in Europe and Dan Weinberger in the US spent a lot of time arguing with uh, people who said that schizophrenia was a, a degenerative disorder. And I remember all sorts of uh, arguments. But after a while, the people who believed in progression, they gave up. And they uh, they, I call them the pessimistic Kreppelinians, because Kreppelin, of course, he believed that schizophrenia was a progressive disorder. But they didn't die, these people. They, they, they lay in their graves, ready to, to come back out again. And the reason I, I am making this joke is because it's a serious business. If you develop schizophrenia, this is not, it's not nice to be told that you have a schizophrenia, but if you're told that schizophrenia is a progressive di di disorder, as Kreppelin thought, a bit like dementia, then this invalidates a lot of your cognition and it's very hopeless. And the, actually the biggest criticism that families have of British psychiatrists is that they're too pessimistic. They still believe Kreppelin, uh, but whereas I think the, the reality is now rather different. So in 2005, they, 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 they became evidence uh, from Jeff Lieberman and others that the brain changes worsened over the years. Never it became thought that this is evidence of degeneration. But thank goodness for Nancy Andreasen. Uh, here she is with her horse, with two horses actually. And uh, some people, we've been talking about, we've been talking about uh, very large, uh, uh, important figures in the history of psychosis and Tim Crow was one and uh, Nancy Andreasen is another one and she of course wrote a famous book called The Broken Brain but she and uh, uh, Dr. Ho, Beng Ho uh, in her group it followed up people with a uh, schizophrenia and re repeatedly scanned them over up to 15 years amazing study and you can see that, oh, here are people who were on a very large dose of antipsychotics, 929 chlorpromazine equivalents. And this was uh, nearly a gram of chlorpromazine. So they're a really big dose. Uh, so that's pretty near, I think certainly in Britain, a thousand milligrams is the maximum you can give. But here are people who had a very small amount of uh, chlorpromazine every day or equivalent of chlorpromazine. And here are people in the middle and you can see that all three groups lost grey matter, but the people who were on the least uh, chlorpromazine lost less uh, grey matter. The, 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 excuse me, the, excuse me, the other way around. The people on the least over on the right hand side, the slope is not so uh, so deep as the slope on uh, on the left hand side. So the people on the more antipsychotic had a worse. Uh, brain change. They lost grey matter volume and they had ventricular en enlargement. Then there was a big argument. Is this a consequence of the antipsychotic or is it because the people who got all these antipsychotics had a much more severe illness and it was the underlying severe illness that caused the brain changes rather than the antipsychotic. You cannot get, you cannot separate the two in, in, in naturalistic studies of a psychosis. So it couldn't be resolved in humans 
but it was resolved in animals. And this is Dorf Peterson and David Lewis, who took some poor macaque monkeys and one control, lucky control group had, uh, had uh, no antipsychotics, one group had haloperidol and one group had olanzapine in, in amounts that they calculated were about similar to what we would give in psychosis. And after, well, they, 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 when I say one group was lucky, well, none of them were lucky actually, because of course they killed them after 18 months and they found that those who were on haloperidol or olanzapine lost between eight and 11% of their brain volume and brain weight. So these were, these were healthy monkeys. They didn't have schizophrenia and it did seem that, that uh, antipsychotics do indeed have this effect on, uh, on the brain. So the evidence that uh, Tony Vernon in, in our department has done a very interesting study or several interesting studies where he's taken rats. In Britain, we can't afford monkeys. We only have rats. So he, gave, he scanned the rats, gave them antipsychotics, uh, and then scanned them again and, on MRI scan and showed that they decreased uh, brain volume, particularly frontal brain volume. Then he stopped the antipsychotic and the, after, uh, the, I think it was after 12 weeks, the brains uh, were back to normal. And so it, 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 this is not neuronal death. It seems to be loss of glial tissue and maybe loss of, of, of synapses. So I, uh, but, and if, we don't really know whether there's any great significance to this loss of, of gray matter. You would think it would be a bad thing, but remember that in adolescence, people have decreased their, their cortical volume and that helps to streamline their brain. At my age, I'm quite keen to hold on to my, as much of my cortical volume as possible, but a decrease in, in people with psychosis has not been uh, shown to be uh, uh, accompanied by a uh, worsening of, of, of the illness. We, uh, you all know that you give antipsychotics, people tend to get bit better. But it does mean, these findings do mean and lots of other studies have shown that what was thought to be progressive in schizophrenia is not progressive, at least much of it. It's due to antipsychotic, especially high dose typicals. These are of course, are people who often take a lot of drugs and alcohol abuse, which is not good for the brain. We know that uh, again, uh, Dr. Casper was talking about a uh, high cortisol and how that uh, may impair neurogenesis, neurogenesis and uh, cause hippocampal damage. And we know that our patients, sadly, often don't take exercise, become obese, develop diabetes and hypertension. And all of these things, as well as cigarette smoking, are bad for the brain. So there's many other reasons, uh, apart from any intrinsic illness, that can cause the brain to, to, to deteriorate. So in 2012, we wrote a paper on the myth of schizophrenia as a progressive brain disease. And we said the clinical outcome is better than we think. There's no evidence of intrinsic progressive brain changes, and there's no evidence of progressive cognitive changes. Or not, the, I, I showed that there, were, there was a very small decrease in cognition in the, the ESOP study when we followed up people. And that was just the same in, in schizophrenia and mania. By and large, I, if there are, are cognitive changes, they're, they're, they're relatively small. So what about the long-term out, out, outcome? We did a follow-up study of a, a group of first episode psychotics studied in London and in Nottingham in the UK. And uh, when I say we did the study, you know that uh, I mean other people that say uh, when professors say we, they mean a colleague. So this is Craig Morgan and uh, Paula Dazan particularly. So about 400 patients were successfully followed up. Uh, interestingly, at 10 years, 65%. So these were first episode psychotics. So about a quarter of them had a... Uh, 
uh, an effect of either psychosis, either mania or depression, but the remainder were, uh, were, were on the schizophrenia spectrum. They were either schizophrenic or schizoaffective or paranoid. And 65% had no psychotic symptoms at 10 years. And 46% had had none for more than two years. So we were very surprised at that. So this is nearly half of the patients had uh, had no psychotic symptoms for two years. And that was 40% of those who got a diagnosis of schizophrenia. But half of these were still taking their antipsychotic and half of them were not taking their antipsychotic. And there's been another three studies from a uh, Harrow in the USA and from Nordentoff and colleagues in, in, a, in Denmark and an Australian study, uh, which has come up with, from Pat McGorry's group, which has come up with rather similar findings. So a proportion of people can come off their antipsychotic. This was uh, about 20% in this study. And that's when we've been telling them they can't come off their antipsychotic. So they're doing that really, uh, at least uh, the, 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 the standard advice in the UK uh, has been not to come off your antipsychotics. So they're, they're managing to do this in spite of the psychiatric uh, ad advice. But of course, that doesn't mean to say that all people with schizophrenia can come off their antipsychotic. This is uh, presumably the, the, the psychiatrist was more willing to go along with the patient when they said they wanted to decrease or stop their antipsychotic if they were doing particularly well. So this is a biased uh, sample. But say, uh, of course, not everybody had done well. 7% had died, a uh, suicide, a uh, accidental and unknown natural causes. You can see that the drug abusers, not surprisingly, but also the cigarette sm smokers were more likely to die. You can see that suicide is more important than we sometimes think. If you think of the overall mortality in people with a diagnosis of psychosis or schizophrenia, then physical causes are by far the most important. But that's because they all, that's through the whole lifetime. We're just looking at the first 10 years and people haven't had enough time to develop a severe a cardiac problems or hypertension or diabetes. They, they, some of them develop that, but the majority of them will come later. And, and we shouldn't, of course, forget about the importance of suicide. Now, you all know that early intervention services have been a very important. And in the 1990s, Pat McGorry in Melbourne, who you can see here, put forward the idea to detect specialist units to detect and provide care with those with the first episode of psychosis. And these, these were pioneered in Australia. And in 2001, it became mandatory that every local service in England had to have an early intervention unit. And these, of course, are holistic. They focus, uh, they, they, they do not generally give a formal diagnosis in the first two years. So nobody says you've got schizophrenia. They say you've had uh, symptoms which psychiatrists call a psychosis, and you may have a vulnerability to these, these coming back. Uh, and we think they, we can give antipsychotics, which will help, but they also give CBT. And it, our local one is called Leo. This is a picture of it. There are, uh, there's another one in Ortus in Copenhagen, and there've been randomized controlled trials from the Leo and Ortus, which have shown there's clinical advantages. While patients are attending these first onset units, they do better than uh, controls. Once they go back to regular services, they tend to deteriorate. Uh, but of course, that is not a reason to, uh, to, to criticize the early intervention units. It's a, a reason to say we ought to have all of our psychiatric services as good as the first onset services. My, my, my wife actually works in the Leo unit and she says one of their big problems is when patients get to the three years when they have to go back to the local services and they still 
haven't they not haven't been discharged they burst into tears because they know that they're that they the, the, the people who have been helping them very much they're going to say goodbye to them and they uh, then they're going to get a much inferior type of treatment uh, afterwards so these are holistic units and have psychosocial interventions the leo unit has uh, as a well in normal circumstances not covid has has a football team and they go they go out they go out off to see the the, the movies and the and and museums and things like that and and they have a, they teach people how to play the guitar and they 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 are very socially intervention so these are these are useful and you all know of course that uh, we're, we now use mostly atypical antipsychotics and you really decide on the side effects. So you have to think, do you need, do, do, is it, do you want to, to treat somebody with medication which will or won't cause sedation? So if people are acutely manic, then you probably do want to give them a drug which causes some sedation as well. Olanzapine would be an, an, an obvious one. But if people are at university and they have to study, then you might well prefer to give something like a aripiprazole or cariprazine or another partial agonist. You have to think that, say, uh, oh, actually, they, they, I, I should have said that the other the other uh, medication, which is say, uh, doesn't produce a lot of. Uh, well, let me come back to that. I. Lorazidone, if, if you're thinking of lorazidone, then uh, again, clozapine, quetiapine, clozapine, and olanzapine are the worst. And lorazidone and aripiprazole, cariprazine uh, are the best. But of course, with extrapyramidal symptoms, the situation is reversed, and clozapine and quetiapine are the best. And uh, risperidone and paliperidone are the worst. You'll notice that Brexpriprazole is not here. Many of you will be able to prescribe Brexpriprazole, but we cannot prescribe it in Britain, which is very ironic because you would think that after Brexit, what a really stupid and deluded action by the government, uh, then we would all need Brexpriprazole, but sadly we can't prescribe it in, in the UK. Anyway, you have, to, you have to choose and our, our a uh, first line for for a uh, for first episode of antipsychotics is currently aripiprazole or a uh, lorazidone or cariprazine. Let's go on. Of course, cognitive behaviour therapy is important, and there have been various randomised trials that show it's useful for anxiety and depression, but also for the positive symptoms. But there remains controversy about this, and there's always people doing yet another meta-analysis. And I think there's something like 22 meta-analyses. Uh, and uh, some of them say cognitive behaviour therapy is wonderful, and some of them say it's average, and some of them say it's not no good at all. And I think this relates to the quality of the CBT. And a drug is always a drug. Well, it should be always a drug, but CBT for psychosis is quite a specialized thing. And we're very lucky at, uh, in, in my institute and hospital to have very good CBT therapists. And this is Emmanuel Peters, who's our leading CBT therapist. And you can see this is, this is a, a series of about a 200 or no, 300 patients uh, who, give, who received CBT and the, the blue is voices, the, the, the red is delusions. And you can see that uh, over uh, six months, there's a considerable improvement, and, but it's particularly in the delusions. The, 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 the voices are, 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 more, are more difficult, but delusions, a CBT can be very helpful for, for delusions. The, 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 these people are having stable antipsychotics, so it's not, not uh, an effect of antipsychotics. In our situation, the people with the worst outcome are those who use continue to use cannabis. And uh, Tabia Schooler, one of our PhD students with, uh, with Sagnik Bhattacharya, she showed that this is the case in, in the literature in general, that 
continued cannabis use after onset of psychosis predicts worst outcome, higher relapse rates, longer hospital admissions, more severe positive symptoms than for individuals who discontinue cannabis use and non-users. And it's especially bad for the, those using high potency cannabis as THC 16% or, or, or more. But I, I don't see enough methamphetamine abusers, but I'm sure they'll say the same will be the case for methamphetamine abusers that the ones who continue to use will, will have the worst outcome. Tobacco smoking is something is very neglected in psychiatry. Many mental health staff turn a blind eye to their patients smoking cigarettes. We, they, we say, well, poor souls, they've, they don't have much to, to enjoy, but they say they enjoy cigarettes, so let, let them smoke their cigarettes. But tobacco smoking accounts for 70% of the excess physical mortality in schizophrenia. So it's important that we should do something about it. And uh, we, and, and I, I, I'm sure in many of your hospitals, uh, cigarette smoking, or most of your hospitals, cigarette smoking is not allowed. And it's not allowed in, in, in certainly in our hospital. But what we do is we provide a, a, a replacement, nic nicotine replacement, either uh, as, as chewing gum or by vaping. And there, as well as the effects on physical health, there is growing evidence that people who smoke cigarettes have an increased risk of the onset of psychosis and of a bad outcome. And uh, I think this reminds me of what we used to say about cannabis about 20 years ago. The evidence is just growing, but it's not enough to be sure. But I think personally, my own view is that uh, people who smoke cigarettes very heavily uh, increase the risk of psychosis and of a bad outcome. In our, in our situation, that our treatment resistant units are full of people who smoke 40, 40 cigarettes or 60 cigarettes a day. I, you know, before their admission. So I think it might well be that tobacco smoking is, is, is a risk factor for, for psychosis and its poor outcome. So what does this kind of model mean for treatment? We think of people with psychosis as having a sensitized dopamine system. We think that they are subject to acute social psychosocial stress. And we covered some of the stresses that they have. I'm just so astonished and saddened when I realize some of the stresses that uh, our patients are subjected to, that uh, I, I, I live in a nice uh, middle-class suburb, but our uh, patient, patient population is predominantly from inner London. And the, 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 the I give you one example of a young man who, actually my wife looked after mostly, who was doing quite well and then he, he was working full time and then he witnessed a murder and he went to the police and told the police about the murder. But then the, the, the gang whose members had killed the, 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 the victim I visited him and said, you will not live very long or you're, it will not be good for your health if you make a statement to the police. So he was very alarmed by this and he became paranoid. And uh, he thought that the, 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 the gang were, fall well, they may well have been following him at first, but this continued for a couple of years. But then he came into hospital and he was treated and his para paranoia went, aw went away. And he was quite well until a neighbor was stabbed. And after that, it all came back again. So it's, uh, it, 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 it just shows that some people live in circumstances where violence and, uh, 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 and threat are, are pervasive. Anyway, if that happens, then this impacts on the sensitized dopamine system. Or of course, drug abuse could also do this and increase, excuse me, increases the dopamine release. This causes a aberrant processing of stimuli what uh, is well known as the abnormal salience, which excess dopamine produces, makes you attend to everything, makes you think everything is important. Why is that person looking at me in that strange way? Why are, why are these red cars following me? I, what is the, 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 the reason for it? And if you've had a very 
lots of adversity. You may have a, developed a, as a child biased cognitive schema where you think other people are doing bad things to you. And this may make you interpret the, the abnormal salience in a paranoid way. You develop psychosis. Once you've developed psychosis, then you think the people down the street are, are out to harm you, or you think that you're that the, your, your parents are, in a, a, are a agents of the CIA, or you think that uh, your, your uh, mother is trying to poison you. And of course, once you develop these psychotic thoughts, you're even more stressed, and this causes more dopamine release and more paranoia. And eventually, at least what happens in Britain is that the, 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 the young man barricades himself, well, shouts at all the neighbours and wave and says, I'll get you, don't, don't come near me. And eventually the police are called and uh, the police drag the patient off to the hospital. And this is uh, very alarming. And uh, there a nurse says to them, well, I'm afraid you, uh, Mr. Brown, you're going to need an antipsychotic. We'll give you an injection. And of course, the patient is convinced this is going to be poisoned by this injection. So it causes even more dopamine release and even more, uh, even even worse uh, uh, psychosis. So you can get into a vicious circle. And what we have to do is to try and do something about the acute psychosocial stress. Is there any way we can re remove the patient from the, the situation of acute social stress? We can certainly try and block the, 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 the excess dopamine or we can give, give cognitive behavior therapy. And in some way, in, in, in one of these ways, we can try and normalize the dopamine system. And I think this is say, what happens in a proportion of people that, uh, that, they, 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 uh, that they're, they, they're not going to have excess dopamine for life, but it can come back down. And this, uh, this is, uh, produces a, a better outcome. But of course, one of the big issues, at least in Britain, is the question of sh should patients continue to take antipsychotics for life or how and when should they be reduced or stopped? And I think there is increasing evidence that people, that a proportion of patients can reduce their, their dose. Sadly, in, in our country, what we tend to do is put people on an antipsychotic and then refer them back to their family doctor family doctors are afraid to change their their antipsychotics so people get stuck on high dose antipsychotics for 20 years or more but it's not easy to reduce the dose of antipsychotics and we've been we've written a couple of papers on this it's interesting there's thousands of papers on how to start antipsychotics because the drug companies pay, uh, pay for these papers but there are hardly any papers on how to stop antipsychotics. So we've written, just re recently written a, a, couple, a, a couple. And one of the big issues is, the, is dopamine supersensitivity. So if you give, so here we have on the left, the normal presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, and you can see dopamine being synthesized and released into the synapse and hitting the D2 receptor. And then you get D2 signaling. In psychosis, you have too much dopamine and therefore we block it with a D2 blockers. And what happens to the receptor? The receptor, all the evidence is that the receptor, uh, th that there's growth of receptors. They become more receptors. There's the greater density of receptors. And this is okay while they're still blocked. But if you reduce the antipsychotic or stop, or certainly if you stop it suddenly, then you have all these receptors which are super sensitive and therefore you get a bigger effect in terms of dopamine signaling. So it's very important to try and allow the, 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 the receptor to normalize. Now here is an, this is a, a viewpoint paper we, we, we just wrote in JAMA Psychiatry. And this, uh, this shows the sort of usual way of reducing uh, risperidone. So here's risperidone, four milligrams, and up here is dopamine D2 occupancy. And you can see that on four milligrams, you have about 76% D2 occupancy. If you go to three milligrams, then you still have about 
a 70% occupancy. Or if you go to two milligrams, you still have about 60% occupancy. So you, you get decrease in sedation and other changes. But in terms of D2 occupancy, there's not really much difference between four milligrams and, D and two milligrams. But if you go from two milligrams to one milligram, you shoot down from 60% occupancy to 42, 3% occupancy. And especially if you, if you go then from one milligram to zero, you're going from about 42, 43% occupancy down to zero. So this is a much bigger effect than there is from going from four to three. So people often relapse at this point. So what one should, what, what, what would one do? What we've suggested is you go, in a, you pay much more attention to the D2 occupancy than you do to the dose. So you can go from seven milligrams where there's 80% occupancy to six milligrams where there's, uh, there's uh, excuse me, when you go to two milligrams where there's 60% occupancy and then one milligram, 40%. But you should be, we would say you should be going very gradually. And especially when you're going below two milligrams, you should, you should reduce from two milligrams to 1.75 milligram and then to 1.5, 1.25, one milligram to then down to one to not 0.75, not 0.5, not 0.25, and eventually a stopping. And this should be done very slowly. It might be that I would certainly I would think if you reduce well, I, I don't think I've ever given in the last 20 years seven milligrams of risperidone as high a dose as that. But if you're reducing from four or five milligrams, I would say that this has to be reduced to be done reducing over a year, or in some case, some say cases longer, and always doing it in agreement with the patient that we'll see how you get on with this decrease in the tiny dose and a uh, if you have any recurrence of your symptoms, then we may have to push it back up again. So I think many of our patients relapse because we don't know how to reduce antipsychotics. And some psychiatrists refuse to discuss this with their patients. And if you say to the patient, well, no, you have to, you're going to be, you should be on antipsychotics for the next five years, or even some people would say for life, then you never see the patient again. The patient, uh, doesn't come back to the clinic and stops the antipsychotic precipitously, there's super sensitivity and they relapse. So we should taper the dose according to the estimated D2 receptor occupancy, not according to the milligram dose of the drug. It should be done extremely slowly, in most cases over a period of months and sometimes of years. And if we do this, a higher proportion of our patients should be able to remain well on low doses of antipsychotics or none at all. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about prevention of psychosis. Now, we have one of the largest and best developed prodromal services in the world. It's called, called Oasis. And it's pr pr proved very beneficial for research. And some of you will know the work of uh, Paolo Fuserpoli, who's one of the most productive uh, researchers in the world. I think Paolo Fuserpoli writes an article before breakfast every day. They're very good articles, but many of them are on the prodrome. So it's been great for research. But do these clinics and does this clinic we have reach a significant proportion of the people who develop psychosis? So this is a lady called uh, Alicia Ajnakina, who, as her name suggests, is originally Russian. And uh, she went through all the patients with first episode psychosis who presented to our local services. And then she went backwards to see how many of them had been seen at the prodromal clinic. So this is the opposite of what is usually done. People usually start with people who come to a prodromal clinic and go forward. But we are taking all the people with psychosis and go backwards to see how many went to the prodromal clinic, which all GPs and psychiatrists in our uh, catchment area are advised where to send patients to the, this Oasis clinic. And you can see here are all the people who came with the first episode psychosis and uh, 338 of them, uh, excuse me, they, 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 that 83.7% had no contact with the prodromal services, but a uh, 55, a percent of them had 
I been to see been to the to the Oasis clinic, but in fact, I most of them were already psychotic. So 41 out of the 45 who went to the prodromal clinic I, were already psychotic. And I, there were only 14 out of the 338 patients who had, a, who had been referred to the prodromal clinic and had the at-risk a prodromal mental state. So in some ways, the prodromal clinics were quite good for picking up uh, people who were already psychotic, but they were they 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 only got a very small proportion of people who actually went on to develop who developed psychosis. So only a very small proportion of patients with first episode psychosis come via prodromal services. So, actually, I should say that. I, I, and, and, and this is a, this the, the, you you you'll think this is paranoia, but uh, we tried to publish this paper and uh, it got turned down by four journals with absolutely vitriolic uh, uh, comments from referees, and of course the reason for this was that the editor of the journal would say, "Oh, this is a paper about prodromal clinics. We'll send it on to the experts on prodromal services." So they got sent to the people who were running prodromal services who didn't like it one bit. So they were very abusive and said it should be rejected. And eventually we, we published in a rather rubbishy journal called uh, BMC, I think it was called. But I think the problem is that this is, the prodromal clinics are too late in the day. So if you think of heart disease, people who have a heart attack, what is the prodromal equivalent in heart attacks? It's angina. By the time people get angina, you're not going to still stop them developing heart attacks. You may modify it or you may help their pain a bit, but it's too far down the line. You're going to have to have some major operation and coronary artery bypass. It's much better to try and get the patient much earlier and, and when they have high blood pressure or high cholesterol. And it's even better if you try and get them and trying to change their habits and get them to diet, to exercise, and not to smoke cigarettes. So the prodromal clinics are the equivalent of angina. And it's too near to the psychosis to be really be able to uh, intervene uh, effectively. It's much better to intervene at an earlier point when they have minor psychotic experiences or neurocognitive problems or anxiety. And there are studies now trying to identify people who have several of these and intervene. Uh, but the best thing to do is to try and uh, try and get them to be less exposed to the risk factors for psychosis, to have better obstetric care, to have a uh, better childhood uh, upbringing, to live in better neighborhoods and not to abuse drugs. So the final point I'm going to say is, does the incidence of psychosis vary? If it does, this may reflect differences in exposure to risk factors. And this in turn would enable us to identify and potentially decrease exposure to important risk factors and therefore decrease incidence. So here is a study across Europe. I'm afraid I have neither Russia nor Greece uh, data on either <laughs> either of these, and certainly no data uh, from uh, from from Pacific countries or Taiwan. Uh, so in each country, this is a very big EU-funded study. We had a big city like London and a smaller place like Cambridge, or in Holland we had Amsterdam and we had Leiden, and we had, or maybe it's the other way around. I don't remember. And then we had Paris and a country area called Clermont-Ferrand. And then we had five places in, 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 in Spain. And we had three in Italy. Italy, for those of you who are not totally familiar, Verona, Verona and Bologna are nice middle-class cities of about 300,000 population. Palermo is a big sprawling city, poor city, uh, with a lot of crime in, in Southern Italy. So which city or which region of all of these will have the highest rate of psychosis? Would you like to think? Why don't I ask the chairman? Daria, are you, are you, are you awake? <laughs> 
which city would have the highest psychosis? Yes, I am awake, Professor Robin Murray, but uh, I'm waiting for, <laughs> for what you say the next. So the answer is London. London. So London had the highest incidence, 61 per 100,000. This is work by Hannah Jongsma in Jamsma, Jamsa a couple, Jama a couple of years ago. London, Amsterdam and Paris, the big northern cities had the highest incidence of psychosis. And the, in the north, the, the northern, more rural areas or the less dense areas are much better. Cambridge is better. Uh, Leiden in Holland is better. Uh, in Paris, in France, Clermont-Ferrand is better. But in southern Europe, the rates are much lower. Think, see, here is Madrid. And he, Madrid has got five million people. Barcelona has got several million people. The rates are really quite low. So what is the reason for this? Why, why is southern Europe protected? Uh, 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 from, from you might think uh, were they missing cases in southern Europe I think they may well have been missing cases but we were missing cases in London as well I don't think they were missing you know nine out of ten cases in Santiago it's, it's implausible so what's the, the, the explanation for the low rates Mediterranean diet well we, we don't have any evidence for that vitamin D Again, we don't have any evidence for that. Migration. Now, a migration was undoubtedly a factor because the big northern cities have had migrants, particularly from the Caribbean and from Africa, uh, for very many, very many years. And, uh, and in Africa and India. And uh, we know that migrants have much higher incidence. So in London, if we took out migrants and their children, we, 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 we lost one third of all the psychosis. So migration is an important uh, factor. So what other, things, what other things do Spain and Italy have that Holland and Britain don't have that might be protective? What about the Pope? Do you think the Pope could be antipsychotic? So it seems unlikely that the Pope himself, although he's clearly a very impressive uh, man and more impressive than some of his predecessors, but could it be social isolation? My wife comes from Palermo in, in, in Southern Italy. She says social isolation does not exist in Palermo. Social intrusion is the problem. Everybody knows your business, but you can become easily socially isolated in Amsterdam or Paris or London. And could it also be cannabis? So this is a, a slide, uh, this is actually work by my wife, Martha de Forti. And you can see that in the black is the prevalence of daily cannabis use in 11 of the centers that we have uh, just uh, discussed. And uh, we, we had to chuck out some because uh, they, they were too small to have decent numbers. But here, again, we've taken out migrants uh, but you can see that in, uh, uh, excuse me, in the grey is the psychosis incidence. So again, London, Amsterdam and Paris are the highest uh, for, for, uh, the, the, for psychosis. And in the black is the prevalence of daily cannabis. And you can see that the one follows the other quite well. It's not perfect, but the correlation is not 0.8. So places that have a lot of... Uh, a, a lot of cannabis ha, ha, have, a, have a lot of psychosis and places that have a little cannabis or especially little a uh, high potency cannabis because this is in 2012 and a uh, high potency cannabis had not reached a uh, southern Italy and, uh, and Spain though it has now. So cannabis is one reason why London has higher psychosis than, for example, a Southern Europe. But has, has London always had high incidence of psychosis? We are lucky we're able to go uh, back and we have data on schizophrenia, not on psychosis, but on schizophrenia since 1965. And this is according to the research diagnostic criteria. Everybody who was treated for schizophrenia that met the research diagnostic criteria since 1965. And the blue is the incidence of schizophrenia. So that 
the, the incident you saw before was psychosis. This is now schizophrenia. And as you can see that in the 1960s, it was about 11 and it went up a wee bit. I crept up to, to uh, 21 in the late 1980s and, uh, uh, and in the 1990s and then, that then continued up. I, I went up to 35. So there has been a threefold in increase in the incidence of psychosis or, and schizophrenia in London. And it, this is the frequency with which cannabis use was mentioned in the case notes of the patients. And you can see that uh, this went up from four or five percent in the 60s up to 53 percent in the uh, in 2010, 2012. So we cannot prove that that this is causal, but it's certainly sus suspicious. So, so let me conclude. I think we have the knowledge and ability to greatly improve the outlook for patients with psychosis. However, a combination of Kripalin, Kripalinian pessimism and lack of resources means we fail many of our patients. But I think we should now begin to think about ways of preventing psychosis. Now, ideally, we would do something about the inner cities and we'd do something about childhood, childhood abuse and poverty very difficult, but I think we could, we should make a start by publicizing the adverse uh, effects of daily use of high potency cannabis. So I will stop at uh, that point and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. One more time and again and again, Professor Robin Murray, very interesting lecture. We love your stories. We adore your jokes. And we highly appreciate you share your knowledge with us today on Sunday. And uh, what we have for the questions, um, there is a question from um, Associate Professor Sanat um, Hasanich from uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, he asks, um, relapses on long acting injectables with confirmed compliance might actually confirm your hypothesis about super sensitivity, which was quite, you know, under discussion by <laughs> APA. <laughs> this, this lecture has gone on long enough. But, by <laughs> the way, we adore your cat on the background and the dog. Oh, where was the cat? It's impressive. I didn't see the cat. <laughs> oh. Yeah. We have the proof. We have the proof that <laughs> there was a cat in the background. So, uh, Professor um, uh, Senad asks about relapses on long acting uh, injectables with uh, confirmed compliance might actually confirm your hypothesis about supersensitivity, which was uh, discussed, discussed, criticized a bit by APA and WPA working group recently published uh, on um, uh, the, the super sensitivity theory. What, how can you comment? Uh, I know that uh, Associate Professor Sonat is reading a lot, a lot, everything, every yeah. day. So I, 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 I agree that, uh, that the consensus of opinion is that dopamine sensitivity is not important. But the one thing I have learned in my life is that whenever there is a consensus, it's nearly always wrong, and, and that that uh, that uh, we do. Sometimes we just accept things uh, because they 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 we, we've uh, believed them for a long time. So it, there's no doubt in animals, and if you think of who are the, who are the high priests of dopamine, a uh, Phil Seaman who sadly just died, and Shatish Kapoor, and they a uh, uh, to, to their group a. Uh, gave antipsychotics to animals, uh, a haloperidol or olanzapine, and found that, and, and sorry, they, they, they looked to see, could the antipsychotics block the effect of amphetamine? And initially, when they gave the antipsychotic, it could block the effect of amphetamine. But after about six to eight weeks, they, and they, when they injected amphetamine, it was not blocked by the, by, by the D2 blocker. <laughs> 
And so what they then did was increase the dose of the D2 blocker. And again, the amphetamine uh, effect was, was blocked. But after another uh, six or seven weeks, that disappeared. So they were giving constantly the, 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 the D2 blocker and they were having to give more each time to overcome the development of D2 supersensitivity. And uh, so this is the, the, this really is the issue. They, they entitled their paper, a breakthrough, a breakthrough psychosis on, on long-term antipsychotics. And uh, I think this is, this is correct. I, 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 it is true that this is an explanation as to why if, if, if you have people who are on a, on a depot antipsychotic, you're sure that they're taking it and initially it works. And after two years, it doesn't work and so on. There are two possibilities. One, the illness is a progressive illness. Now, I don't believe schizophrenia is a progressive illness. So the alternative is that the drug is becoming less effective. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And so that, that is my, my, my view that uh, constant, particularly high dose uh, antipsychotics is more likely to induce dopamine a supersensitivity. Now, while we're talking about lo long acting antipsychotics and particularly paloperidone, there is a very interesting study by Wyden and his colleagues who, who with, with uh, Janssen. And what they did was to look at all the people who stopped antipsychotic, who were, who were randomized to the placebo arm. And they looked to see how long did it take before they, they, they relapsed. And the people who were, these are people with established psychosis, so I would believe that they have supersensitivity. They're randomized to, to, from oral paloperidone to, to, to placebo. They break down, I think the mean was 56 days. And what about the people who were on monthly paloperidone? So they didn't start counting till after a month. Till the paloperidone was was due for the second dose but it was about a hundred days before they on average broke down and then they looked at the people who were on three monthly paloperidone and their their a level of relapse was much lower and much slower and they they never got i think they followed them up for 365 days and still the majority of the patients uh, who had come off and onto placebo had not relapsed. So either there is a uh, there is a continuing effect of the paloperidone, or the D two receptor has had some time to readjust, or some come back, uh, uh, some some a uh, a combination. But the general message is that uh, that uh, coming off very slowly, whether it's uh, off a depot or off uh, an oral medication is, is I think, much safer than, than, than trying to stop antipsychotics uh, uh, suddenly. Of course, there are some patients who will never be able to stop antipsychotics, but uh, for those uh, who, want to, who, who are very in, uh, keen on trying it, I think you can work with them to, to very, very slowly decrease the, the, the medication, while, of course, keeping up with the psychosocial treatment. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. I think Sinat is uh, uh, very excited and happy with your extended answer and detailed answer. And uh, one more question, I think the last one, because we have just, I think, five minutes to finish the session. It's uh, the, from um, Dr. Isa uh, Multasam Nur from Indonesia. He asks, um, the explanation about psychosis development was related to social factor, maybe connected with social cognition in psychosis, or is this something about stress death is a theory? Uh, thank you, Professor Murray, for your answer, he's saying. So I may not have totally understood that, but I, obviously <laughs> people with psychosis have a... Uh, they have deficits in in, 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 their, in their social cognition and uh, theory of mind deficits. They may also jump to conclusions precipitously. And uh, I, 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 one, I mean, it's not a literature I know 
extremely well. But I think that, that, that Michael Green, who, who did the study showing that neuropsychological function, poor neuropsychological function, uh, predicted a uh, poor outcome, he's also shown that poor uh, uh, social cognition predicts a poorer outcome. So I personally, I would think that uh, it will be the group who have the poorer social cognition who are going to be more prone to, to, to the effects of stress. Uh, and it, it may be that uh, the dopaminergic induced uh, abnormal salience will be more likely to induce a uh, psychotic thinking in somebody who's already got a uh, deficit in, in social cognition. But that, that's a very good question. And I think it, it sort of shows how how we need to tie up the different uh, aspects. I, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of studies on stress, and there's lots and lots of studies on social cognition, uh, and there's lots, there's now more studies on a dopaminergic function, but really ideally one would want to, 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 to look at all three of these together. Thank you very much, Professor Robin Murray. Just one short question, one more short question uh, from Alexei Pavlichenko, who is Associate Professor from Moscow. Uh, can we expand your data regarding the slow tapering of anti antipsychotics on all other antipsychotics? Yes, Alex, and that's a very nice, easy question. To, that, that, that We started <laughs> off with very difficult questions, and now you, you've asked me one which I know the answer to. And the answer, of course, is, is, is yes. So when we were writing that, that viewpoint paper, we, ha we, we had to have, I think, less than 1,200 words. But we've now expanded this in an article which has just been accepted and will be published in Schizophrenia Bulletin within the next month. And it, it's much the same uh, for all uh, antipsychotics anti, anti uh, that... Uh, that slow and steady is is the best. That I uh, that it's uh, you know you have to think that all of the studies that all the placebo controlled studies that have ever been done have been done on people who are already receiving antipsychotics. So what we do is we give people antipsychotics and then we randomize them either to a placebo or to a uh, continuing antipsychotic and most of these studies the the people who were randomized to placebo they came off their antipsychotic very precipitously uh, so if uh, it, it may be that as well as their presynaptic problem that they had as part of their proneness to psychosis that we had also induced a postsynaptic problem iatrogenic postsynaptic problem which will facilitate their their their, their, their relapse so very very slowly is, is is the question and always checking with the patient uh, have they had any return uh, of their symptoms or checking with the relatives uh, are are you are they is their personality are they are you getting on well with them or are they beginning to become very irritable and, and a bit paranoid so thank you for the question and thank you thank everybody you. For, for, for 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 all the questions thank you very much so slow for better goals for better achievements in the better care and treatment of our patients. Thank you so much, Professor Robin Thank Murray. You. And uh, um, we can have uh, we can have uh, five or 10 minutes, maybe both with uh, Robin and Siegfried for uh, some small talk on big issues. Does that mean you have a question, Costa? No, no. <laughs> no. Well, uh, with uh, with Sir Robin Murray, we had a debate uh, a couple of weeks ago during the CIMP concerning uh, the way we should uh, use antipsychotics. And I'm not going to de debate with Costas again. He's too good at debating. <laughs> no, no, what I wanted to say is that it's, uh, the, the, the picture is so complex. It's so complex that we, there are so many things. Uh, 70 years, almost 70 years after the introduction of antipsychotics, there's so many issues we don't know, we are guessing. As I said, I, I don't know how, for example, alipiprazole with uh, six or seven days of uh, half-life can uh, exert a, uh, a therapeutic uh, effect in acute mania on day two or three, uh, or how floxetine can have these 
uh, effect uh, within the first uh, few days or a couple of weeks. And still, we uh, these, these observations are in accord with our main theories and, and, and a lot of other details that we, we don't really know. So, you know, I was I was uh, looking at the literature on um, uh, the effect of antipsychotics on uh, brain structure, especially on gray on gray matter. And what I found <laughs> was a very tricky paper suggesting that the bold signal in fMRI, that's not structure, of course, but still, there is also a similar paper for lithium suggesting that some agents we are giving, they might change the signal. So we get an artifact and they, they, they move the signal from black to gray and from uh, gray into white. So what you get is an increase in brain volume, which is marginal, but still it exists. And then you have a, a shrinkage of uh, uh, white matter and a shrinkage of black, which is liquid. So it's a, a, a number of interesting uh, questions. Uh, so I, th I, th I, th I think this is... Not, this not is to discuss the Talarai uh, atlas and uh, the way you uh, methodologically you do MRI. I mean, and this is across all the, all the field of research, we have a problem of methodology. And I think Danny Weinberger in particular has been getting very uh, angry and grumpy about, about the overinterpretation of structural MRI and saying, saying exactly what, uh, I, mean, I, I don't think his paper is the original one you're quoting, but th this, this view that uh, it's curious that you have a decrease in gray matter and an increase in white matter unless or the, vice versa or vice versa uh, unless the explanation is is as you say that the mri is misclassifying uh, 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 people uh, and i think that may be, that that may well be the case though certainly uh, the, the the poor rats and and uh, and, uh, and and monkeys who who were given antipsychotics they 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 did see some some real changes in, in their brains as well. Siegfried, uh, do you want to comment on the lithium or or uh, or other aspects? Well, I think um, I don't have any knowledge on lithium and gray and, and and these other matters. What I think is very important that we have a very close uh, relationship to our neuroradiologists. So in Vienna, I'm very happy that this neuroradiologist is not run by psychiatrists. It's run by, by real mathematicians and physicists who look at the kidney, they look at the heart and look at all these other things. And I always talk to them to get the methods right. And uh, definitely the methodology is a very important issue. And But let's come back to the... To the, uh, to the topic of schizophrenia. One of my first papers in the 70s when we had in Mannheim in the Central Institute of Mental Health where I worked, the first CT scanner it was one of the first in Germany. And we looked at schizophrenic patients and we found with the course of this disease, the ventricles got larger in these days and we were so shocked because we were not allowed in these days to talk about, about a biological basis. So I wonder, and we published this also as a short letter to the Lancet and everything. But I wonder, uh, what do you think, uh, Robin, what are you doing with the old, you know, like of the Vogt uh, collection, which you're probably aware of, the Vogt collection in Düsseldorf? They looked also at all of these brains and they found also in unmedicated schizophrenics, also enlarged um, ventricles in, in, inducing or also in, uh, uh, representing then also some brain uh, damage in these schizophrenic patients. How do you bring these old papers together with the new findings? No, no I, I, I totally agree that I think uh, there is a huge enigma meta-analysis that uh, looked at cortical volume in 5,000 people with schizophrenia and controls. And when they looked at unmedicated people, exactly as you say, they showed a decrease in cortical volume, an increase in ventricular volume compared with the controls. But then the people who had had antipsychotics 
a had a for, an atypicals had a further change, and I think it was worse on people who had had typicals. So it, 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 I, I don't think there's any doubt that that at onset people, that, that uh, there are some subtle changes in at least the proportion of people with schizophrenia. And that personally, I would think that uh, that these are people who have had some developmental uh, problem, or maybe they or they've had they've they've inherited a copy number variant or some some major disruption to to the development of the brain. And so I think uh, it's uh, it, it, I would say that the, 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 there's there's no doubt that the, the the brain changes are are in many patients there at the beginning, but get worse. If you, th I, I'm sure you you probably wrote to the Lancet because that was where Tim Crow and Eve Johnson's paper was published, right. and uh, sure. but interestingly there was a, another letter to the Lancet in 1976. I, of course, this will be no interest to 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 uh, to many people who regard this as prehistoric. There was another letter from the professor of neurology at the Institute of Psychiatry at our institute, who said, "Have doctors Johnson and Crow." given thought to the possibility that these changes may be in part due to antipsychotics. Uh, and uh, I remember him saying this, and I never paid any attention to it at all until I saw the paper from Nancy Andreasen. So, uh, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. But, but you know, there are data yeah. from before the era of uh, antipsychotics suggesting okay. such an effect. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The Fucht, uh, Fucht collection. But let's let's look at depression. You know, in depression, we have this very imp impressive finding that the number of untreated depression, um, as just a calculate, Shailin is the, the one who published it in 2006, I think, in Biological Psychiatry. The number of untreated depression is highly significantly associated with the shrinkage of the hippocampus. So in depression, I think we have just the opposite then with regard to the to the hippocampus as the most important structure. Then I think in depression research we cannot blame or we cannot make a, a, a story for like three cyclics versus SSRIs. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a different story. Yeah, but I, I think also don't... in 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 schizophrenia also that say. Uh, that say uh, that schizophrenic it's been shown that there's a relation between the high cortisol uh, and the, the decrement in the hippocampal volume so i i'm agreeing with you that uh, yeah. stress in both depression and in in mm. psychosis can have its adverse effects on the on the yeah. hippocampus i think a lot of the fact the effects that we used to think are specific to Either schizophrenia or anxiety or depression or PTSD. I think they overlap. Mm. But uh, Robin, may I ask you what you're doing? Because I also have a number of, of schizophrenic patients, and I always beg them, please don't smoke cannabis. And they tell me, yes, yes, no, I don't smoke again. And the next time I ask them, of course, they smoked cannabis. What's your key? What? How do you deal with these young schizophrenics when they still continue to smoke cannabis? Yes, well, I, I what I do is I refer them to my wife who runs a clinic called the Cannabis and Psychosis Clinic. Oh, and uh, they, they, I, uh, they get lots and lots. They, it's one of these clinics that has they, they far more patients than than they can deal with, but they uh, have a combined. Uh, well, they use the same sort of. And they use the same sort of uh, approach as they would uh, be used in addiction. They use a combination of CBT and motivational interviewing. Right. But they, all, they also uh, pres prescribe Sativex. And Sativex is, uh, uh, is a cannabinoid drug uh, produced for a uh, multiple sclerosis. And it mm. contains a small level uh, proportion of a THC and an equal equivalent of CBD. Mm -hmm. And it uh -huh. smells a bit like cannabis. So you get it as an inhaler and the patients quite like it because it, uh, it, it is reminiscent of cannabis in its smell. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit like, uh, as they, use, they, they do in, 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 in opiates or alcohol, you're prescribing a, a medication to enable the patient to come off the withdrawal because the cannabis, can, can cause quite a bit of 
cannabis, suddenly stopping cannabis can cause quite a lot of insomnia and, and agitation. So we cover that with, with Sativex. And so we, we, it's just a pilot study so far, but we're hoping that we'll be able to do a, 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 an RCT. And so far, it's a, I mean, the, the, the average British psychiatrist says, stop taking the cannabis and they come back and they haven't, they haven't stopped taking the cannabis. He said, well, I can't be bothered with you. Go away till you stop, till you stop. So it's yeah, the yeah. same with any kind of addiction. You have to be so patient, don't you, to, and they may relapse, but eventually, I don't know anything about uh, methamphetamine. I imagine getting people off methamphetamine is even worse. It's worse, right, definitely, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, very interesting. I'm very hungry, Costas. Oh, Daria, <laughs> it's up to you now. <laughs> I haven't we, had my lunch yet. We, we all put weight during the quarantine. Oh, yes. please, please, no. <laughs> Prof Costas, it's a very fragile issue. <laughs> uh, thank you so much to everybody, to our legendary speakers, to Professor Konstantinos Tontolakis, to Let's Study Greece, Georgios Psalas, to our amazing... Uh, supervisor of the webinar, Professor Ming Chi Huang. Thank you very much for accompanying this impressive discussion. Uh, the lectures are superb, and we hope we have your agreement to have these lectures uh, to be presented on YouTube and uh, to be shared with more people who are really eager to listen to okay. these lectures. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to everybody and hope to see you in reality, <laughs> not only in virtual environment soon. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you next time.